Look, I made a countdown timer. Very proud of myself. Hey, everybody, what's up? All right, so I know we did like more scenic group flights the last couple weeks, but um, obviously I focus a lot more on the like avionics and the Garmin stuff. So I thought it'd be cool to hunt some clouds, try to find some low cloud layers that we can do some like IMC approaches into, like hopefully down to minimums if we can um, try to find some kind of sketchy weather to fly through <laughs> at least low cloud coverage. Um, hey, Jared, what's up? Hey, Dale. So I have four flight pulled up. Um, you can't see it, but there's a feature where you can show the category that each airport is in, meaning the weather category. So it'll show whether it's VFR, uh, marginal IFR, marginal VFR, or full IFR. Um, so I have that pulled up in front of me and I'm trying to find some airports we can fly to that are currently in IFR conditions. So there are some near Albany and it looks like it looks like there's one up in Burlington, Vermont. So I'm just going to do some quick planning here. And first, let me show you guys how you can do this without four flight. It's not as exact because you don't get the IFR conditions exactly like like four flight gives you, which is, you know, it, it gives you the METAR. You might be able to do this with like Sky Vector and turn on the METAR reports on there. Uh, but basically, I, it just shows the map and I have a red dot whenever it's in IFR condition so I can easily find this. But within the world map here, you can do some of that. If you go down to the filters down here, you have to go to the more section at the bottom and then open filters. It's in the bottom left of the screen. And then here, there's a background map. And then under that, there's weather layer. So the second one right here, I think it defaults to clouds. So if it's not on clouds, you can change it to clouds and that'll just show you straight up clouds. And then you can also change it from clouds to, precip to precipitation. So if you specifically want to find rain or snow, um, you can do that. And there's actually not too much of it in the United States right now. There's some up here to the north. Um, is this Quebec? Yeah. Towards Quebec and Montreal up here, there's a bunch of weather. And actually down here around the area we're flying, there's some precipitation as well. But this is a quick way you can yourself try to find bad weather if you want to fly with live weather instead of using a preset and you want to hunt for that weather around the globe, you can do that. So you can find a storm system or something. You can see there's a lot over here in South America and Anyway, the U.S. seems pretty clear right now for heavy precipitation, but um, that doesn't mean that there aren't clouds. So back in the filters, you can change this to clouds and see, you know, over here in like the Colorado area, lots of clouds, but not too much precip. So in this case, yeah, you can see over here in the northeast, like uh, in the New York area, up in New England here, we have a bunch of clouds. So I think it'd be cool to fly along. If some of you guys want to join along, feel free. Um, the way to do this in multiplayer, if you've never done it before, is first in the top right, just click on your name. And then here, it'll have all the servers listed. So I'm on West USA. So this is how you make sure you're on the same server. And if you play with friends, this is how you do it too. Just make sure you're on the same server. And there is group functionality where you can group up with people. But what's easier than that, um, if you don't mind seeing other players besides like you and your friend group, when you go into flight conditions here in the top right under multiplayer options, if you just choose all players, um, this is a good way to just see everyone regardless of their weather settings. If you choose live players, this means that you're locked in to live weather and live time of day. So you will only see people that are using live weather and live time of day. But if you choose all players, you'll see everyone in your area that you're flying in, regardless of if they're using the current live time of day or live weather. So in this case, anyone could go in and change, you know, change the time of day to nighttime, for example, change the weather to clear skies, and you would still see them flying around you. So it's just kind of the most uh, flexible way to do it is leave it on all players. I generally like to use live weather and then just override the time in the bottom left here if it's too early or late in the day if it's too dark. I'll change this just to get the lighting that I'm looking for. I think I'll just leave it on live for today, though. Hey, Dale, which plane should you use? Uh, let's take a look at the airport we're going to. 
I think in general, um, because I focus on the G1000, any plane with the G1000 in it is good if you want to follow along with the avionics and practice with the G1000. So the planes that have G1000s are the SR22. That's in the premium edition, though. Um, the one everyone, the ones everyone will have are the Cessna 172 G1000 is one. The 208 Grand Caravan. This is a turboprop. I I think the Caravan is one one of the most versatile planes. I think you pretty much can't go wrong choosing the 172 for a little slower, and then cru and then choosing the Caravan for something a little bit faster. I think the Caravan's like just as easy to fly as the 172. Even though it's a turboprop, that kind of seems intimidating even for me to think about. But a turboprop is not, this one specifically, is not all that difficult to fly. We're not going to fly it to like a study level because uh, I couldn't teach you that. But in general, you just leave the propeller and the fuel condition levers at maximum. Um, you can lower them during taxiing and if you want to reduce noise. But in general, and you know, especially when you're just doing the sim casually, you can pretty much just leave them at max and only use the throttle, just like you're kind of used to doing um, in other simpler planes. So it's less intimidating than it seems if you've never flown the Grand Caravan before. Um, other planes are the Bonanza and the Baron, both the Beechcraft uh, planes have G1000. So G36 Bonanza and the 58 Baron, those have G1000. And then finally, the Diamond, uh, the DA-40 is a good one as well. Everybody has this plane as well. Um, so in terms of if you have the standard edition of Microsoft Flight Sim, so you don't have the Deluxe or the Premium add-on, go with the 172, the 208 Grand Caravan, or the DA-40. Um, actually, right now, I would avoid the DA-40. Sorry, I take back the DA-40 because the current patch made a change to the nose wheel. Um, the DA-40 in real life has a, a castering or a free castering nose wheel, which means this wheel does not turn like it does on the 172, where the nose wheel itself will actually turn left and right to steer you on the ground. How the DA-40 and actually the Cirrus as well, how they work is you actually apply braking to turn. So this wheel will turn on its own. You don't have control over the wheel itself you apply brakes to turn in the direction you want to turn. Um, and that's very messed up right now with the DA-40. So I would avoid that. Um, I'm going to fly the Grand... Uh, I could fly the Grand... I'm going to fly the Grand Caravan. Um, if you guys want to fly the Grand Caravan as well, that's great. Because um, you'll catch up. And if you haven't used it before, I, I would give it a shot during this stream if you're going to fly along. Because... Like I said, it's not it's not that intimidating. It's actually easier than you think. Yeah, 172 is fine as well. We'll be a little faster in the Grand Caravan. Uh, okay, I'll fly. Sorry, but it's changed my mind again. I'm gonna fly the 172 as well because I don't want to be faster than everyone. Um, but the Grand Caravan's fine. You'll just have to watch your speed. All right, I'll keep it simple. I'll go banana yellow. And we're going to take off. Let me see the departure here. Albany, it looks like a good one. Um, Albany's um, VFR right now, so the weather there is decent. But up to the north, there are several airports that are in IFR condition right now, including there's one called Middlebury in Vermont. And then another one a little north of there, which is Burlington International. So I'm just going to check how long it'll take us to get there. Oh, that's way too long. Okay, an hour and 55 minutes. So I'm going to do this on the fly because I'm using live weather and I want to watch the live weather um, and have us follow it and actually fly into some, some IMC conditions. So Burlington is still pretty good. Maybe we can just take off nearby Burlington. Let me try another one here. Sorry, you're going to have to follow along with me while I kind of do this on the fly. Okay, this is a little too far. Basically, I can just zoom in and just find any airport around here as our departure. I just want to find something that's not too far away. This is decent. Okay, let's um let's do this. Edward F. Knapp State. So this is KMPV. So this will give us 43 minutes, but it'll give us time to take off, get our autopilot going and get the procedure dialed in and all that and talk about the procedure and brief it. So 43 minutes will be decent. And we'll do a couple of these today. We'll do two or three. 
And then for arrival, we're going to choose Burlington. So that's KBTV. So Bravo, Tango, Victor. I'll type these in the chat as well. KMPV to KBTV. And again, if you guys are just tuning in and you want to join, in the top right up here, just make sure you choose West USA for the multiplayer server. And then in flight conditions right here, make sure you choose all players, this second option right here. And then we should be able to see each other. Sometimes it's a little finicky. Um, so yeah, load into KMPV. You can take the 172. You can take the Baron or the Bonanza. You can take the Grand Caravan if you want or the SR-22, those are all good options for the G-1000 if you want to join with the G-1000. And I'm going to be using the NXI. Let me turn the music down again. It's getting a little ravey in here. Um, as you guys know, I use the G-1000 NXI extensively, and, and I don't personally think there's any reason to not use it anymore. So if you don't have the G-1000 also, go back to your home screen, go here under Marketplace, and then in the search, this is showing up here for me. If you have free, it might show up for you. G1000 right here in the middle. Or in the search box here in the top right, type in G1000. And hit enter, or however you do it on a controller. And then you should be able to find the G1000 right here by working title. And then just install that. Down here, you'll have a download button to install it. It'll just take uh, a few seconds, actually, because it's only like one megabyte. It's very, very small. And this will replace the stock G1000 in every plane that has a G1000 in it. So I highly recommend doing this. Um, this will become the new default in Microsoft Flight Sim. So if you're not using this yet, you'll ultimately be using this, like it or not, <laughs> because it'll be the default in the sim. Jared's going to take the G36. Awesome. Yeah, I, I haven't flown the Bonanza or the Baron very much. They're really cool, but I haven't learned them at all. So... I'm going to stick with the 172, but the Grand Caravan is great as well. All right, so make sure you have the G1000. Make sure you're on multiplayer server USA West or West USA up here in the top right. And then again, here's the flight plan. And what I'm going to do at the top left here is change this from VFR down to IFR. I'm mainly doing this because I want air traffic control to assign us an approach. Um, we may need to override that, but if the weather in Burlington is uh, what it says it is in real life, um, there are some low-level clouds there. There are clouds at, let's see, looks like the, the lowest layer is only about 3,000 feet AGL, so that's not too bad. We might, we might try to find something a little worse for us later. Anyway, I'm going to choose low-altitude airways here, and it is still just a direct flight because it's such a short uh, distance. Uh, but we'll take off, and shortly after taking off, they're going to give us our um, approach because we're so close to the airport. And then we'll practice loading in that approach and flying it. Now, um, something people ask pretty often in the G1000 videos is, um, why doesn't air traffic control work? Why can't I file my flight plan? And that's because the G1000 does not synchronize with ATC right now. Basically, the SIM and the G1000 don't talk to each other. So... That hopefully will happen in the future. But for now, the only way to get air traffic control to follow your flight plan is by programming it in using the world map. So you can do it the way I've done it here, just by clicking around. Or if you're a little more advanced and you're using something like simbrief.com or little nav map, I think also exports plan files, you can import those plan files here as well. So as long as you do it within the world map, you do your planning, then air traffic control will know what you're doing. And then further up here, once you choose IFR in the top left corner here, we're going to choose low altitude because we're not going to get into the jet airways. That's eight into the flight levels. So that'd be 18,000 feet and higher in the United States uh, and in Canada. But we're going to fly low altitude because we're in the 172. We're not going to be over 18,000. We're, we're not even going to be over 10,000 on this flight. Um, and then finally over here, once you choose IFR, you can manually choose an approach if you want. So here you can see the list of all the approaches available at Burlington. And we're going to play the game, which is the, I guess, more realistic thing to do, which is leaving it on automatic. 
you can choose whichever one you want. If you're specifically flying a certain approach type, you, you want to force it to give you a certain approach at a certain runway, you can choose it here and air traffic control will talk to you and give you this approach. They'll assign this one to you. If you leave it on automatic, it will choose for you based on the current weather at your destination. So it'll surprise us and choose something for us. It'll say like, you know, um, fly the RNAV 15 through this specific rate, uh, waypoint. All right, so once you've uh, done all that, uh, instead of the runway, just choose a parking spot. So I'm gonna choose a small ramp and then load in. And again, make sure you're on all players. And then the rest of this is up to you. I have live traffic turned off just to simplify it. And I'm using live weather and time. Now, if you don't use live weather, you're not gonna see what the rest of us see. Um, but it's up to you now. If you don't want to deal with the weather, then and you can turn it to a preset. A lot of rain here. Awesome. Moderate rain and mist. KBTV. Yep. And it looks like the clouds are not super low. So we're not we're not gonna get all the way down to minimums here. So for the next flight, I'll try to pick something that's a little scarier uh, for our approach. It would be really cool to get down to somewhere where there are clouds at just a few hundred feet AGL. Um, right now at Burlington, it, the real life METAR says few clouds at 033, so that's 3,300 feet. Broken at 5,000, overcast at 6,000. So we'll have quite a bit, um, we'll have quite a bit of clouds on the way in. Not so much once once we're coming in on the approach. Once we're descending, uh, we're going to be out of the clouds at 3,300 AGL. And remember, whenever you look at a METAR, uh, you look at a weather report. The cloud layers that are listed are in AGL. They're not in MSL. So that's above ground level, not what's shown on your altimeter, but what's, you know, the measurement from the ground. Um, and why that's convenient too is when you're on an approach, if it says, um, you know, it's overcast at 400 feet, then you know that's 400 feet AGL. And say you're on an ILS with a minimum um, high, uh, decision height of 200 feet, you would know that you're going to break out about 200 feet before your minimums. So it's easier to compare the AGL instead of, um, you know, worrying about the, basically you'd have to worry about the minimums, your barometric pressure setting and all that. The ILS is going to take you in regardless of your barometric setting or your altimeter setting. Um, anyway, yeah, the cloud layers are in AGL. All right, I'm going to get this started using the assisted checklist as always because I'm lazy. And when it freezes, that means that I have to push a switch on my throttle quadrant here, on my honeycomb. Test and set the brakes. 6B0, Middlebury stay as broken clouds, 800 AGL. Where is that at? We can switch to that next. Let's do this as like a warm up one, then that sounds awesome, Gabriel. Oh yeah, something like 800 AGL, or below anything below a thousand would be great. Uh, hey, Michael, I set up uh, last night trying to log a flight plan on your 530 and X plane using your tutorial on the 530. Oh, yeah, it should work roughly the same. I mean, they're both going to mimic the 530. Um, and actually, the X plane version should have a few more bells and whistles compared to the stock Microsoft version. Um, you could install the mod on Microsoft Flight Simulator if you want. There's a free 530, 430 mod. Um, if you just Google it, you can find that pretty easily. It's by the same guy that makes the um, GTN 750 mod. But that's a good one. It, it adds um, a few pages. It adds a traffic page. Um, it adds, uh, what else? A VNAV page. Stuff like that. Don't be lazy. For the sake of all of our time, I'm going to be lazy with the checklist. <laughs> and so I can read chat while this is happening. Oh, it worked great. Yeah, the mod is really nice. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Yeah, I'm not flying a real plane in real life. As you guys can tell, this is a simulator, so I am going to do things that save time and uh, just get me to the uh, to the fun part, which right now is flying in some IMC down to our, using our approach through IMC. If this was a uh, live stream and a camera and a real plane, I would definitely expect people to be like, uh, that's not safe what you're doing. But uh, thankfully we're in a simulator, so we can uh, we can treat it as seriously as we want from flight to flight, and I do that. Some some flights I'll take it very seriously. I'll try to, I'll manually do the entire checklist and all that. I'll 
check the weather uh, furiously on my approach and, you know, all that stuff. But for the stream, for, uh, you know, keeping up with chat and simplifying my workload, I definitely will take shortcuts and keep it a bit more casual. Hey, Mechan or Mechine. First live, well, welcome. Thanks for joining. Do I have both honeycombs? I do, um, but honestly, the alpha stays in the closet most of the time just because I have my microphone in front of my face and uh, the yoke gets in the way a little bit. So I use the Airbus side stick and then I use the honeycomb Bravo. Uh, but I highly recommend all the honeycomb stuff. Their, their stuff is amazing. Middlebury, 27 nautical miles southwest of KMPV. <laughs> Somebody, sorry, flying overhead. <laughs> Okay, I'll turn on the traffic nameplates in a minute. Okay, that's run up. Parking brake is on. What's our outside air temperature is 10. So I'm just gonna turn our pedo heat on in advance. And then here uh, on the NXI, you have the next rad weather radar. If you want this turned on, you can do it on either map. You can do it on the inset map over here on the PFD or you can do it on the MFD. It's up to you. I I try to keep the MFD clean usually, not not turn too many things on. Um, but anyway, if you want to turn it on here, you can go to map options in the bottom left right here and then just hit the next rad button at the bottom and this will turn the next rad uh, weather radar on. Now this isn't um, this isn't a capability of radar on the plane. Some planes have their own um, like weather radar capability, like the TBM has its own um, weather radar, like on board. Um, this is next rat is like the satellite based stuff. So this is, um, you know, delayed something on the TBM would have like a radar. That's like basically a real time scan in front of the plane as you're flying, uh, which is pretty nuts. But yeah, this is, uh, this is from the satellite data. Use buttons on the TCA. Yeah. Um, I use I, I mostly use the the hat for just quick look left and right like this and then I'll push it up to oh it's Sirius XM uh, I'll use up and down to like look up like this like when I'm taking off and landing for this closer view and then if you hit down a couple times it'll put you into this view and you can cycle through all the views with left and right so all of this you can do just on the hat so I do this a lot on the thumbstick um, and then I use, you know, just the autopilot disconnect and I have one button set for smart camera on my thumb. Besides that, all the other buttons I use are on the honeycomb Bravo. So parking brake, pedo heat, electric pump, and then obviously my levers, my gear, my autopilot, my flaps, all that stuff is on the Bravo. So it's great. All right, so uh, just to go over some of the new features again, if you guys haven't used the text METAR, um, you can hit the flight plan button now, and then you can turn on the cursor. Um, if you use the new style where it highlights the controls as you point at them, you hold down the left mouse button on the FMS knob like this, and then right click, and that turns the cursor on. Then you can use the outer knob here to point at one of the airport codes in your plan. So if it's an airport, so here's our origin. If you point at it, highlight it, uh, with a cursor right like this then it'll show you the METAR at the bottom here so we can see our cloud layers and stuff so for example few clouds at 1700 feet broken at 5500 feet for example and we have our altimeter which starts with the a two nine or four niners our altimeter setting so i'm going to set that over here you can set it manually with the barrow knob like this or if you're feeling lazy you can press the b key on your keyboard and that'll automatically set it for you I do notice that sometimes it's off, like this METAR, so it says 2949. When I hit B, it says 29 or 47. Um, so there seems to be some discrepancy between the METAR and the weather the SIM thinks it's in. Um, not really sure, some kind of bug there. And then we have our wind as, as well right here. If you're new to reading these, you can just pick out you know, the most important parts for you to start, just to kind of learn it. So that would be the wind right here, 220. So it starts with the wind direction and then the speed. So the wind's coming from 220, meaning if we're heading 220, that's favorable for us to take off and land at that heading and at eight knots. 
So 220, the first three are always the heading, and then the next section is the speed. And it'll also tell you if it's gusting as well. So it'll be longer if there are gusts, it'll tell you if it's gusting to a higher wind speed. So here we have 220 at eight knots. So if there was a runway roughly heading of 220, that'd be favorable for us to use that runway. Um, I remember when I first started looking at METARs and learning them, I, I had no idea initially that the wind direction is where the wind is coming from, not the direction it is uh, is going to, like towards 220. So if you phase 220, you have a headwind, not a tailwind. Um, and then here's our visibility right here. That's in statute miles, so 10 statute miles. And then after that, we have, um, it has a remark for selling, there's rain. And then here, few clouds, broken clouds, and overcast clouds at these different levels. And remember, these are all AGL. So this is 1,700 feet. And this is in hundreds of feet. So 1,700 feet, 5,500 feet broken, and overcast at 7,000 feet. So these are AGL, not MSL. AGL meaning above the ground level. So you can see we're at 1,100 feet right now. So that does not mean um, uh, that does not mean that these clouds are 600 feet above us because it's AGL. We're at AGL right now. We're at ground level. So 700, 1,700 feet above 1,100 is where the clouds are, and that's where the bottoms of the clouds are. So that'll be roughly uh, 2,800 feet MSL. But you know, when you reference this stuff quickly, when you look down here, you just say, oh, a uh, few clouds at 1,700 feet. Well, I'm taking off, so that means I won't be in those clouds for 1,700 feet of uh, altitude gain. I have 1,700 feet I can climb before I should be in those clouds. All right, and because we did our flight plan in the world map, it already has our route here set up for us. You can manually program all this stuff in. I haven't done a tutorial on that because it doesn't sync with air traffic control yet. So if you... If you do this planning in the G1000 directly, you can do it. You can use the FMS knobs and then use the inner knob and enter all your waypoints in. But if you do this in the world map, air traffic control is not going to know about your changes. That's just a limitation right now. So if you want air traffic control to follow you around um, and give you your approach and all that kind of stuff, you got to do it in the world's map like we did uh, like 15 minutes ago or whatever it's been while I've been rambling. Okay, and another useful thing that I like to I like to use um, on the PFD options, oops, sorry, on the map HSI options over here, I like to use relative terrain. So when we take off, it'll show the terrain around us on this little inset map here. And if you don't have the inset map on, you can just hit map HSI and then layout over here. And you can either use the inset map or some people like this HSI map, kind of replaces the HSI, the um, our heading indicator, basically. Um, or is it horizontal situation indicator? So it's basically like a like a CDI and a heading indicator combined. But I like the inset map because I like to see kind of the traditional compass or HSI look right here. All right, subdued route is in. Runway 23 is good. All right. All right, so I'm going to go and turn on the nameplate so I can see you guys. I think I turned on the gold color ones now, so see how they show up. So if you go under general traffic options, you can turn on the multiplayer nameplates here. I'm using a mod for mine. Uh, you could just Google like MSFS nameplates to find the smaller ones because the large ones can be a bit obnoxious. So these are a bit smaller. These are kind of hard to read. They're different colors, but I guess I chose the wrong color for today. All right, so we're going to take off soon. I'm going to taxi out to the runway. And then what I'm going to do, because we know we're in weather the whole time, <laughs> this is obviously not something we'd fly into. We would avoid this completely, but we're going to have some fun in the sim today. Just play around. Um, we'll get we'll get some crazy weather going through here. So, yeah, obviously this is not a day we would actually fly. Um, so what I'm going to do is turn this off, though. I'm going to go back to map options and turn it off because I really like to see just my flight plan here. And then I'm not going to announce or anything um, on the ATC just because nobody else will hear it. And somebody said that runway 23 is good. So that'll be the runway 
heading 2-3. Actually, is there a 2-3 here? Oh, there's one up here. I'm going to look at the runway info right now. And we can't look up the runways in the G1000 NXI just yet. So This is Edward F. Knapp. And then, yeah, we have a 5 and a 2-3. And then we have a 1-7 and a 3-5. And so the wind is the same at all the runways at about 8 knots. Look for some alternates, yeah. I mean, the, you know, yes, realistically, we would look for some alternates for sure. Or, you know, realistically, we wouldn't fly in this at all. Uh, you know, this is insane to fly in there. We have severe weather over our destination airport. We wouldn't even, uh, you know, we wouldn't even take off. All right, parking brake is off. And yeah, it looks like any runway will do. They're, uh, you know, they're all at the same. Actually, let's see if, do we even have an ATIS here? I think this is untowered. Bangor radio. Request IFR clearance. All right, so I thought this was untowered, but it's, uh, it looks like it's untowered, but we also have, I don't know why it's called just radio. Anyway, if you want, ATC to assign you the approach. So what we did was we did our plan at the world map. If you start on the runway, it's going to automatically do your IFR clearance through ATC for you. So that means when you load in at the runway, if you bring up your ATC window, you'll have a transcript of the IFR clearance that you got. If you load at parking like I did, then you have not done the ATC clearance yet. So mattering the airport you're flying from, you may be able to do it on the ground with clearance or a ground frequency. If you're at an untowered airport with no frequency that's available to request the clearance from, you may need to take off first and then you'll be on a like a center or a departure controller or an approach controller. One of those controllers outside of the terminal area and then you would request your IFR clearance from them once you've flown. But since we have one here, I can request the IFR clearance right down here. And so they're going to give us our initial climb instructions. Climb and maintain 4,000. Okay, and I'm going to read it back. As soon as you read it back here, it's going to automatically set your um, squawk code, which is your transponder code, and put it in altitude reporting mode or mode C. So you'll see right down here, it's going to change from 1200 standby. It's going to change to 1216 and then say altitude. So that's automatically on. You can do this yourself if you want. Um, and the way to do that is just go to the transponder button right here, X ponder transponder. And then here, these are the different modes on the left. So altitude reporting mode. So this will show them the altitude that uh, our plane is reporting to be at. And then here you can hit code and type in the four digit code. So in this case, it was one, two, one, six, but it'll set it automatically for you if you do this with ATC and you hit the read back button. And then they told us to climb and maintain 4,000 feet. So the first thing I did down here on my altitude knob for the autopilot, I use the outer knob. So this inner knob is hundreds of feet. The outer knob is thousands of feet. And mattering what you're flying, you may just have one altitude knob. And I changed the selected altitude right up here to 4,000. So that's our initial climb and maintain is climb, maintain 4,000. So that's what we're going to do when we take off. The next thing I'm going to do to set up autopilot is I'm going to set up our vertical mode. So I'm going to do all this. So when we enable autopilot, it's just good to go. I'm going to turn on a heading mode for now, even though uh, we're going to wait to sync this to the runway heading. Once we get to the runway, I'm going to hit flight level change mode. Flight level change mode lets us specify a speed to climb at instead of a rate in feet per minute. In my opinion, you should pretty much always use flight level change when you're climbing with autopilot. And what do you set this to? The easiest thing to do is to set it to your VY speed. This is your best rate of climb. Uh, this isn't always what you'll climb at. You may want to climb closer to VX, which is for obstacle clearance, you'd use a slower um, airspeed so you can climb faster but your most efficient or best rate of climb is VY. And you may want to use something that's even faster than that. Like if you want to have a higher ground speed, 
while you're climbing, you would have a higher speed, like a cruise climb setting or something like that. Especially after your initial climb, you may want to raise that. But anyway, to keep things simple for now, and a lot of the time, I just use my VY speed as my target flight level change speed. So here I'm going to hit, uh, sorry, it's counterintuitive, but this is correct. Um, I'm going to hit nose down because when you pitch the nose down, it increases your speed. So it sounds weird when we're not in the air, but nose down increases your speed. So that's why you have to hit nose down to turn the number up. Um, so I'm just going to hit that a few times until I'm at 74. And you could, you know, if you want that higher ground speed, you could turn that higher. Um, once you're in the air, the nose up, nose down uh, terminology here on these buttons makes a lot more sense because if we're in cruise, let's say, and we are changing, you know, we're using uh, flight level change mode. If we hit nose down, the nose of the plane will pitch down to increase our target airspeed here for the autopilot. So that's why that's why it's it feels flipped, but it's really not. All right, so 74 knots, so we're good to go. Um, so we're gonna go over to which taxiway? We can use whatever we want. Mr. Mondeo, yes, West USA. Um, you can have live weather on, but make sure you have all players turned on. So when you're in your flight uh, condition menu or you choose multiplayer, make sure to pick all players. Uh, that's just the most, um, it's the most, um, Reliable, I think it's just the easy. It just simplifies things, and then people have the flexibility to choose their own time of day and that stuff. And yes, KMPV is the departure airport. That's Kilo Mike Papa Victor. KMPV, and we're gonna do a couple flights, so you can always um, you can always catch up uh, for the next one. And I got our pedo heat. Turned on already. Fuel pump is on in advance. Only one taxiway. Yeah, it looks like we could go. Let's see where I'm at here. Yeah, it looks like we could go to 17 or 23. 17 seems to be the easiest. It's a slightly longer runway. Um, it doesn't really matter though. The wind is variable. Um, and you know, we're not. Again, we're having some fun with this. We're just, we're learning some about the NXI. It's okay if we bump into each other and goes through each other. I'm not taking this whole thing super, super seriously, right? We're gonna do some flights. We're gonna practice using the NXI for some approaches. Uh, if we bump into each other or uh, speed on the taxiway, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna worry too much about that because, you know, I like to have a good balance of fun uh, and seriousness at the same time. Like we're, we're, lear we're learning the systems and we all know that this isn't real life right now. Um, so, you know, unless you're really focusing on practicing that stuff in the sim, I think it's okay to just, you know, chill out on those things and, you know, just reduce, reduce your workload and have some fun with it at the same time. I try to strike a balance. <laughs> I know some people take it much more seriously, but um, I always try to remind people that like, the flight sim is not necessarily just for people that are learning to fly in real life. It's not for people that are, and even for those people, they don't always want to go through, you know, the paces of doing every single possible thing perfectly when they're in the sim. We can just choose to focus on what we want to choose on, choose to focus on. So that's why the sim's really powerful is um, you can focus on the things you really want to learn at that moment. Anyway, it's a bit of a rant. And I'm going to turn on, I have four flight in front of me. I also have Navigraph. I'll pull up Navigraph on the stream once we get uh, in the air and we figure out which approach we're going to fly so we can review the approach plate. Um, if you guys do not have Navigraph, I mean, for now, you can just look at the stream to see the chart. Navigraph uses Jeppesen charts. So those are worldwide charts that you can use. Um, if you're in the US and you don't have Navigraph and you don't have access to Jeppesen charts, you can always use the FAA charts in the United States. Those are free. There are some differences. Um, supposedly people that fly in real life, like real pilots, tend to almost always use Jeppesen charts for IFR stuff. Um, but, you know, use what you have available. And another site that's really good for grabbing charts worldwide is ChartFox. Dot org, I think, chartfox.org. That's a site where you can find freely available charts like the FAA charts, but worldwide. All right, so we're going to, looks like runway 17. 
But you can take off, if you guys are on the other side of the airfield at the other parking, you can just take off from over there. Dude, nice bonanza. Look at the, the flame liveries. The, the new bonanza liveries are funny. They all have flames on them. I think both the Baron and the bonanza have the flames. All right, yeah, you can line up wherever we want here. There's so many of you guys. <laughs> I like that we're all spaced out. We don't have to be, but we're just spaced out. All right, so once we take off, remember, we're going to be... Uh, our course is to the northwest, but we're going to fly runway heading first. Um, and what we're going to do is... Right now, I'm going to sync my heading bug straight ahead by pushing this button. So a heading of 170, roughly. So when I turn on autopilot... Um, we'll be able to just maintain that. All right, so we're gonna go full throttle, slowly up to full throttle, and then we're rotating. If you're in the 152, our rotation is at 55 knots. I got my fuel pump on. Six feet of distance, please. Yeah, we do. It does feel like we got a little bit of a crosswind from, it looks like the right a little bit, but I'm having to put in a lot of left rudder. In the 172, our rotation speed's 55, so once you get to your rotation speed whenever plane you're flying you'll pull back and it looks like we need some right ailerons a little bit counteract that wind yeah we have an eight knot crosswind from the right and then pitch up for your vy speed now this kind of weather this really shows the advantage of using the g1000 like the glass cockpit view where you have the synthetic terrain so we can literally just look at our screen um, for guidance here all right, so I'm just pitching up at 10 degrees, just following the flight director. So if you're flying, while you're flying manually, you can just try to match these two, match the yellow to the magenta flight director. That shows you basically where to go to stay on course and to climb to the altitude that you've put in. And down here, so I'm gonna turn on autopilot right now. And you, you know, you can do autopilot if you want. I, I like to use autopilot a lot just because it makes my life easier when I'm zooming in and stuff and showing you guys things and talking in chat. Here in the bottom left, because I have the relative terrain mode on, we can see that we're over 500 AGL now because it's yellow. Now that it's green, we're over 1000 AGL. So remember we were at 1100, we're at 2100. So now it's green right underneath the plane here. So this is a kind of a nice like radio altimeter almost. We can see our AGL height from the color coding here. Okay, and we're climbing to 4,000. So what I'm gonna do now is tune into Boston Center. So we got our clearance, but because we're not on with a tower at this specific airport, we're gonna tune in to the departure frequency. So they gave us this frequency up here when they gave us our, um, when they gave us our uh, departure instructions, they gave us departure frequency. So we're gonna tune over to departure and contact them and let them know that we're climbing to 4,000. And now we're going to listen to their instructions. So we've just been flying runway heading. They give us the updated altimeter. So we're going to update that right here. As always, you can hit B if you don't want to reach down and zoom in and stuff. And they said continue as planned. So we're going to turn on to our course. So we're in heading mode already. So I'm going to take the heading bug and I'm going to turn it all the way around down here to turn us around to go towards our course. And we're totally in IMC, so this is exactly what we were planning and what we wanted. <laughs> so we're in the clouds. So yeah, use that heading bug, and we're going to turn, make a right, long right-hand turn here to turn around towards our desired course. And you can see here that the line is broken to the right, so I'm going to keep turning the heading bug to the right, right here, and just come at the broken line at an angle. So we're going to go towards our course that's planned right here to the right. So I'm just turning that heading bug to point towards that direction. And now the weather is insane. We're, we're, we wouldn't fly this in real life. The weather is absolutely nuts, but it's going to be fun to fly this in the sim. And I definitely recommend using the autopilot. Uh, you know, if you're if you're not if you don't use it that much and you want to learn it, um, or in, you're in weather like this, like it's really nice um, to turn it on and just have it hold us. Um, steady. Sometimes the autopilot will actually get tripped off if the weather is too severe. We have like a 30 knot crosswind. We would never be flying in this in the 172. Um, but you know, it's the sim, so it'll be fun. Hopefully it doesn't uh, destroy our plane. 
All right, and now what I'm gonna do is hit nav over here because we're getting close to the course. And now it's capturing it. So um, just a reminder with the NXI, you need to fly close enough to your programmed course before you can hit nav mode for the GP or GPS that puts it in GPS mode up here. Until you can use nav mode, you have to fly close to the course. And you can do that manually or you can do it like we just did using heading mode. All right, and I'm gonna pull back on our throttle a bit here. We were over, uh, our RPMs were in the red. So I'm gonna pull back down to about 2400. Bring it in the green arc over here on our engine instrument display, or EIS, engine information system panel over here. Let's bring it back down into the green. And that'll make it less bumpy with all this crazy crosswind that we're in. I see some of you guys behind me. I see a Rosh. Does that say M Rose? I think uh, you can tell the plates are really hard to read. I think I chose the wrong color. Race card Bonanza. Do I know any page to look for VFR charts? Yeah, I, sorry, I saw that earlier, Melkin. It is chartfox.org. Um, oh, VFR charts worldwide. Chartfox is one. It's mostly IFR charts, so I don't think it, I don't think we have VFR charts there. All right, so we're at four thousand feet. Altimeter is still two niner, four niner. So if you don't have that set, make sure it's set. So we're at the right altitude, and we're on our GPS course right now. So we just have this direct course. We're just going directly over to Burlington here, and I'm going to bring up the airport info for there. I'm doing this on my iPad, but I'm also going to do it right now using Navigraph. Oh, the white's easy to read. Yeah, I tried the blue one at first, and that wasn't as easy. All right, I see Endgame in front of me. Gridlock. I got you guys. I hear someone right next to me. Formation flying it. Formation flying an IMC. Totally safe. Totally legal. <laughs> Subdued rat. I don't know who's right behind me because they're so close, but they're in the blue 172. Uh, yeah, Sky Vector's good for VFR in the US. I think it has worldwide. It's it's much more detailed in the US, but not as detailed outside of the US on Sky Vector. So I honestly don't know the answer to that just because I fly in the US primarily. All right, I'm turning my... All right, we're over 3,000 feet, so I'm going to lean my mixture just a little bit. And go over here. I'm still actually trying to learn how to use the lean properly. Um, I did talk to one of the working title guys, K2. He was talking to me about it um, and pointing out that you don't have to lean and then turn on the assist. That you can turn the assist on first and then start leaning. Uh, but anyway, I'm just going to lean this a little bit. We're only at 4,000 feet, so it's not a huge deal. I think the POH is above 5,000 for the 172. It's either three or 5,000. One of you guys can correct me, but we're in between the two. But I could do it without the assist just by uh, leaning. I, I am selected on the hottest cylinder here, number four. And then I think the rich of peak on this is to go minus 50 to minus 100 degrees from peak EGT. So it looks like 1510 roughly is the peak. So now I'm gonna lean it for about 4560. Or sorry, I'm gonna uh, enrich my mixture and go for about 45, 456, 455 on the EGT. Still learning about mixture. I have a lot of articles to read about it. I just haven't done my homework quite yet, as you can tell. And the EGT does not um, update super fast, so I might have overshot it already. I'll see in a few minutes. The wind is wicked. Yeah, this is insane. Yeah, we're at a 30 knot cross, or not, you know, it's, it's from the front left, but uh, we can see the crosswind component if we want by going to uh, PFD options and then under wind, Option two just gives us like a wind sock, basically. Um, option one will give us the crosswind and the header tailwind, like as it'll show us. So we have a 20 to 25 knot crosswind right now, which is, which is crazy. 
Um, if we go here, this is the full wind speed. So yeah, mattering where we are, it looks like it's pretty, it's varying quite a bit right now. Okay, so if you guys are using in-game ATC, make sure you've contacted Boston Center. And they gave us the altimeter. They'll say continue as planned. And once we get closer to our destination, they're going to assign an approach to us. And then we're going to react to that approach. Um, for you guys that have something like Navigraph or ForeFlight or little nav map or you have any charts, anything you prefer for charts, you can pull that up. Um, I'm going to pull that up right now. So I'm going to use Navigraph to do it. Um, Navigraph is pretty a pretty popular option. Um, it's only for simulator use. It's not for real life use. Uh, but what you can do is go up here and hit, I can type in KBVT and hit enter. Oops, KBTV. And then it gives me Burlington. And then if I hit this little maps button, you can barely see. This will bring up a list of all of the charts that are available for Burlington. And here I have the approach chart. So I can start clicking through these and we can load up the approach chart for the approach that we're assigned. And then we can brief this on our way in. Um, because of the conditions, I mean, we can basically predict, we can try to predict what's gonna be active. I mean, there are a couple ways. First of all, there's ATIS. If we tune into our destination ATIS, we can listen to what runways are active and which procedures are we're gonna expect. So it'll probably say something like, uh, ILS runway 15 is active or something like that. So then we'll know. And then the last thing is that um, we could also look at the METAR to kind of predict what the runway in use will be just based on the wind. Um, we can do that with the NXI. Like I showed earlier, if you open the flight plan, we can look up a text METAR in the latest version, this area down here, by just highlighting with our cursor. And we do that by hitting the FMS knob in the middle right here. So. I left click and while holding the left mouse button, I right click, that turns the cursor on. If you have, if you don't have the new lock mode, you'll just push the center of this button. You should get a little hand icon. And then all you have to do is use the outer knob to point to the destination airport and we'll get the METAR right here. So winds 210 at nine. All right, so they're passing us over to Burlington approach. So we're gonna acknowledge that handoff. And again, if you, if you don't use ATC much, the window is up here at the top. Just hit the one right here that looks like a tower. This little like uh, ATC tower, that'll turn on ATC. If you don't have that in your toolbar, go over here to the custom toolbar menu and check it right here. This is where you add and remove things from your toolbar. And you may need to hit this reset panels button if it doesn't show up correctly. So we're gonna turn into Burling tune into Burlington Approach and contact them, tell them our altitude. Hey, Trimon, what's up? You can join in the next one if you want. All right, two niner, four niner, which is what we have still, so we're good. And we're again gonna wait for them to give us the approach, but until then, we can figure it out in a couple ways. So first of all, if we look at the METAR, it's 210 at nine knots. So any runway on a rough heading of 210 is gonna be favorable for the winds. Um, the runways there are one niner, and one five. So, and then there's a three three and a zero one. So let's see, the one that would be closest would be, I guess runway one nine or would be our preference, right? So that's only 20 degrees off from the wind. So we have two one zero here and I'm looking up the runways using four flight, but um, if you have, if you have Navigraph or something similar that you use, you can go to the taxi area and look at the airport info, the airport diagram. Anyway, okay, let's go back where uh, we got our assignment already. So. so if I go back here and review it, they said expect ILS runway 15 via Hero, or it looks like Hero. So ILS runway 15 is what I got assigned. It looks like Gabriel got assigned RNAV 15. So if you want to fly, I'll fly the ILS for now because I tend to do RNAV. I'll do the ILS because that's what he gave me. You guys can do the one that they gave you or what you're allowed to do is hit here and say, stand by, select another approach. So if you want to, you can use the ATC window to force picking another approach. So here you would say, stand by, and then you can choose here. But I'm gonna go back and acknowledge the assigned approach. 
So if you did not get ILS 1.5, I'm going to do the ILS 1.5. And I'll show the charts for that. If you guys want to follow along with the ILS 1.5, choose another approach using the menu here and choose the ILS 1.5 and choose Harrow or Hero for your transition. That's the one I'm going to be flying. Or you can do the game, you know, do the realistic thing, which is set up for the approach you were assigned. So I'm going to do ILS 1.5. So I acknowledge that. I'm going to go down here and we're going to hit the procedure button down here in the bottom right. We hit proc. That's for our procedures. Select approaches highlighted by default. So I'm going to press enter. And now we choose our approach. So we got, or I got the ILS 1.5. It's already highlighted. So I'm going to hit enter. And then for the transition, we got hero or hero. So I'm going to use the outer knob here to choose hero and then hit enter to choose that. Minimums, we could set these later, but I'm going to set them really quickly right now because I have Navigraph ready to go. So here in Navigraph, I'm going to click the ILS for 1.5. And then at the very bottom here, I'm going to look at the minimums right here for ILS 1.5. Our decision altitude is 576. That's for the ILS approach. If there's no vertical component, if we have no glide slope, it shows the localizer here as well. We're going to do the ILS, so 576. So I'm going to turn our minimums to Barrow. That's the, based on our barometric pressure. And 576, we always round up, so 580. So we never want to be lower than the assignment. So here's 580. I hit enter. I'm oh, sorry, enter doesn't work here. I have to use the outer knob. This previews our procedures, so we see our final approach fix and all that. We'll review that soon. And remember, they they told us to go, we were cleared direct to Harrow. So instead of just load, load will just put it in my flight plan. Activate will put it in the flight plan and it'll activate it to the first waypoint. So you can see it's already switched. And now Harrow is our active waypoint. This is our initial approach fix, IAF. So we're going directly to Harrow. And it automatically did that for us because I did activate. If you just did load, it wouldn't have changed our active waypoint. And we could go in and then manually activate it later to go to our initial approach fix. All right, so we're going to Harrow now. This is ILS 1.5. Jared says I was under 400 feet before I could see runway at ILS 1.5. It's nasty, awesome. <laughs> You know, this is something that would be terrifying in real life, but this is something we can, you know, play around with in the sim, which is really fun. Yeah, the winds are insane. Oh my God, this is insane. We're going through like a tornado right now. Um, this may be a good time. You know, again, this is really unrealistic. They would be flying this weather. We would never fly in this, um, but we're just having some fun with these approaches and just doing some extreme weather stuff. Uh, sorry, I had the map up. Um, so uh, what you might want to do is go into your general options and turn damage off because if it throws the plane around too much, it'll just end your flight, uh, which can be uh, which can be a pain. Yeah, Gabriel, I got it. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, if you if you don't want to risk it black screening and ending the you know I called it a game ending the the session, you can turn off your damage temporarily. Um, I'm going to do that just for the sake of the stream because I don't want it, it to uh, I don't want it to end the stream. So under here, if you go to failure and damage, you can just turn off like the engine stress damage, for example. This would be the one the wind would apply to the aircraft stress damage. So I'm just going to turn that off so it doesn't end our stream. If I crash, that's my fault. But aircraft stress, I'm just going to turn that off for now because the winds are insane. OK, so anyway, we loaded our procedure over here. So if I zoom out. It's hard to see. Let me close the flight plan. And now in the latest um, in the latest NXI, you can pan the map. So if you push this in, hold left mouse button and right click, you get a cursor. And now if you click and drag that knob, you can move the cursor. So actually, this is pretty much just a straight in approach. We're like, oh, we're stalling. Oh, we're not, we're not actually stalling because of airspeed. I think we just had a gust there. Um, so over here, yeah, we can see this is pretty much a straight in. We have a top of descent and bottom of descent marker over here already because we're only at 4,000 feet. So what I'm going to do is review our altitudes. So I'm going to open the flight plan again. And here we can see our VNAV altitudes. These altitudes for VNAV 
these um, are automatically programmed in from the basically the Garmin database, the NXI database for the procedure. So these will match up with our approach plate over here. So if I look up the approach, we can look at our altitudes here on this profile view. So we have 2,200 feet right here on the left. And then we have 2,000 here at the final approach fix. So right here where it says FOVES with a little X, that Maltese cross, that's the final approach fix. It also says GS, so that's glide slope. So we'll get the glide slope at 2,000 feet. Now this is an ILS, so this is not an RNAV approach. So because it's an ILS, we have a localizer frequency to use, and that'll automatically be programmed in for us. Um, so if we want the ILS frequency, it's up here at the top, 110.3. It says localizer, so that's the localizer frequency. We're doing the ILS, though, so we'll have a glide slope. Um, so that's 110.3. So let's go back here and make sure that's actually what's being used by our navigation radio. And yeah, 110.3, it's right here. You can see that it was programmed in automatically for us. So when we get to the initial approach fix, let's see, we're on the way. So we're 14 miles away from the initial approach fix still. Um, once we cross the initial approach fix, we're going to be preparing, you know, after that, we'll eventually be at the final approach fix. We pretty much want approach mode turned on before we get to the final approach fix. And that's on the autopilot. Um, so we'll use that to capture the glide slope. So in general, you're going to get your vertical guidance at the final approach fix. If you guys are doing an RNAV approach that has vertical guidance, so that would be an LPV or an LNAV, VNAV on the chart. I'm sorry. Let me do something real here real quick. I'm going to turn on an automatic thing. All right. That shouldn't be a problem again. Sorry, I guess. So here, um, initial approach fix. So this is where we're heading right now. That's the start of our approach procedure. And that's where they directed us to go is to Hera or Hero. 3,400 feet. What I'm going to do is set up my VNAV first. So here at the final approach fix, we want to be down to 2,000 feet by the time we get to the final approach fix called FOVES. So 2,000 feet is our ultimate target altitude before we'll get our vertical guidance from the ILS in this case. So I'm just going to turn our altitude selection here using the altitude knob down to 2,000 feet. And you can see VNAV right here is 3,400. So it's showing our next target altitude in magenta is 3,400 feet. That matches what's over here. So you can see we're, we should get down to 3,400 feet by the time we get to the initial approach fix. Anyway, now that that is set up, we can just turn on VNAV mode by hitting VNAV right here. And now we can confirm that that's on standby or activated right here because it says VPATH. So that means that when we get to our top of descent marker, which is already calculated for us in six minutes, it looks like, our top of descent, it's going to be on the map over here as well. There's this TOD. That's where it's going to start. That's where it's going to start the uh, descent for VNAV for us is at that top of descent marker. So that'll automatically bring us down to 3,400 feet when we get to our initial approach fix at Hero or Hero. Now we have a procedure turn as part of this and we're coming in straight in, so we don't really need to do this procedure turn. Like we wouldn't do this coming in on a straight in unless ATC told us to. Um, actually, technically we would, we would do this unless ATC told us not to, um, but, or they cleared us to, you know, they vectored us to the final approach fix, for example. None of that stuff happens in Microsoft Flight Simulator the air traffic control isn't going to tell you to not fly the procedure turn. Um, so what I'm going to do is just delete that from our... I'm just going to delete this procedure turn. Oh, I'm wrong. Sorry, we're coming in from the opposite direction. Yeah. Actually, no, we're going to leave the procedure turn. Sorry, I didn't even review it. I've been so caught up talking that I didn't review the thing, which is a great, great mistake there. So yeah, we're doing the reverse course, yeah. So we do need the procedure turn because we're turning around in this case. 
you guys that got the 3-1 approach, or the 3-3 approach rather, instead of the 1-5 or the 1-9, you guys have a straight in approach. Um, the one I got for 1-5, or sorry, 1-9 is the opposite side. Or 1-5, sorry, I have the wrong uh, map up here. Well, I'm just making all sorts of mistakes. K, B, T, V, there we go. Okay, there we go. I had the wrong uh, stuff on my four flight. I'm doing four flight and I'm doing Navigraph and I'm doing the NXI at the same time. So sorry about, sorry about the mistakes here. All right, so 3,400 feet. So that's our initial approach fix. So yeah, like uh, Macon is pointing out is, yeah, we're doing the reverse course. So our initial approach fix, we're gonna fly over this point um, and then go outbound and we're gonna make our procedure turn. So our reversal to come back towards the airport and then we'll fly heading southeast bound for runway 15. And one thing you can do in the new version um, of the NXI, the latest version is go to the flight plan and turn on the cursor like this again with the FMS knob. And as you move from one point to another and highlighting them, it's gonna automatically move the map for you. So this is a, an easy way to review the flight plan which I hadn't done yet. So here, if I highlight Harrow, I can see us heading to the initial approach fix right over here. Highlight the procedure turn. It's gonna show me from Harrow to the procedure turn, we're flying outbound. And then you can see us making our turn here. And then after that, we have, I think this is, this waypoint, I don't think we should technically see this. Um, I'm gonna ignore that for now. I think this is, this is part of like the internal NXI route or something after you complete the procedure turn. And then after that, we go on to the final approach fix here. So once we turn around, because I'm on the ILS, once we turn around here, I'm gonna switch over to use the localizer for our navigation to line us up with a runway. And then we'll be waiting for the glide slope at the final approach fix of Phobes right here at 2,000 feet. All right, so let me just review. I'm going to review that again just for my own my own brain. So we're doing the ILS-15 at Burlington International. We're using Harrow for, or Hero for our initial approach fix. That's where we're heading. We need to be down to 3,400 feet by the time we get there. So we already have our autopilot set up in VNAV mode. So that's what the VPath means right here. So that's gonna take us ultimately down to 2000 feet, but the first descent it's gonna do is down to 3,400 feet. And you can see here on my little inset map, we're coming up to our top of descent right here. So this is where it's gonna start our VNAV descent for us automatically, bring us down to 3,400 feet first. And remember, you have to set your selected altitude lower first before you can enable VNAV mode on the autopilot. All right, so then once it takes us down to 3,400 feet, we're gonna continue outbound to the northwest until we get to our procedure turn up here. And that's already programmed in, so it's gonna do the procedure turn out here. It's gonna turn to, I believe it's gonna go out this way and then turn to the right, and then we're gonna intercept lo the localizer course which will be on the way to our initial, our final approach fix right here, which is called OVES. That's our final approach fix. And the final approach fix is where we're gonna get our glide slope. So if you guys are doing, let me check the RNAV real quick. For you guys that are doing the RNAV, it is an LPV approach. So basically you're gonna treat this just like an ILS, except you don't have to switch to use your navigation radio. So this is the RNAV15. You can see down here in the bottom left, it says LPV. Let me zoom in a bit more. Down here in the bottom left where it says LPV, that's basically the subtype. Okay, sorry, let's talk to ATC. Descend to 3400, so we're gonna acknowledge. So it's safe for us to go down to 3400. Safe for us to go down to 2200. Okay, we acknowledge that as well. You can see that those match the altitudes over here in our flight plan. So they're clearing us all the way down to 2,200 feet. So we're at the correct altitude 
before we uh, start our procedure turn. And then we'll be at that altitude when we complete our procedure turn. And then from there, we're going to drop 200 feet more down to the final approach fix. So that's all set up for us. We don't really have to worry about that. We're going to monitor it, um, but we don't have to worry about it because we've set our VNAV down to 2000. So you can see it's already activated that just now. So it's, it hit our top of descent. It's taking us down now. I'm going to pull my throttle out a little bit because we don't want to overspeed, especially in these crazy winds. And that beeping and that O right there, that's the outer ILS marker that we're passing over. Um, and now it's capturing 3,400 feet. So it stepped us down to 34. Sorry, I know I'm going back and forth a lot here, but it's because things are happening in the plane. We got to take care of that first. Then we'll go back to the chart. If you want to silence those marker, uh, those marker sounds, you can actually do that over here with the marker mute button. If you hit that, you will not hear the ILS markers. So if you're not flying the ILS or you don't, you don't want to hear the marker beeps, you can turn that off. All right, so let's check our speed here. It's getting low, so I'm putting my throttle back in now that our descent completed. We got a bunch of guys here in front of us too. I haven't checked in with everyone yet. We got a bunch of people behind us and a bunch of people in front of us. Some people have already landed as well. Yeah, thanks, David. Yeah, aviate, navigate, communicate. So yeah, we'll make sure the plane is good at first. Um, so we're just making sure our throttle is set in a good place now. Okay, so um, let's continue. I'm gonna show you guys the RNAV again. These are very similar. So you can see this is the RNAV 1.5. If you guys are flying this one, your final approach fix is the same as ours for the ILS. It's called FOVES, and you also need to be at 2,000 feet. But you're gonna get the LPV. This is a WAS powered, or uh, WAS is like the United States like beefy GPS, basically. It's our upgraded GPS system with ground-based stations and satellites. So LPV is, um, is basically the ILS equivalent. The minimums are a little bit higher. You're at 250 feet AGL instead of 200 on the ILS but you're gonna fly this the same way you have FOVs as well. So you're gonna be at 2000 feet by the time you get to FOVs and that'll give you the glide path. So you'll see, you'll see a GP later on when we're doing the uh, final descent there using our vertical um, guidance. Because I'm using the ILS 15, we'll see GS for glide slope. And our, um, our indicators here are gonna be green to represent our navigation radio and the navigation radio based ILS system on the GPS or the WAS approach for the LPV, yours are going to be magenta colored. So that's the differences we'll see here is I'll have green indicators over here with my green glide slope diamond. You guys will have magenta indicators with your GPS, your WAS based LPV approach glide path. And for you guys, you don't have to worry about the navigation radio if you're on the RNAV. It's all GPS and WASP powered, so you don't have to switch over to the localizer. Okay, so that one's the RNAV, but I'm gonna go back to the ILS because I was assigned the ILS, so we're, I'm gonna fly that one. And here you can see with the moving maps, we're about to do our procedure turn. It's actually a little further out here. It looks like it matches up decently. This isn't to scale. Uh, necessarily it just means that you have to do it within a certain range right here within 10 nautical miles um, from a certain point so this is from the uh, from where's LOM I don't see that on the map oh right here LOM's right down here which is um, this navigation aid down here to the south of the airport all right let's watch this really quickly before I review the rest of the plate we pretty much know what we're doing because it's here. Um, we have our final approach fixed at 2,000 feet. That's where we're going to get the glide path, or the glide slope in this case. So we already kind of know what's happening here. I'm still going to review the chart a little bit, though. Um, so we're going to make our right-hand turn and then two left-hand turns to be back um, lined up going inbound to the runway. And once we make that turnaround, I'm going to leave our navigation source on GPS because the G1000 will automatically switch. The NXI specifically will automatically switch for us um, to use our localizer. And it's already tuned into the localizer frequencies up here. It's got them on nav one and nav two. I can bring those up down here on my bearings if I want to. Here's nav one and nav two. I can also turn on DME 
to see our distance from uh, the localizer. So we're 12.7 miles right now. And sometimes you have to use that stuff for um, for these procedures. I'm not going to get too far into the details. We're just going to do the procedure turn and make sure we capture the glide slope to go down to minimums. And apparently this is uh, pretty low here. Yeah, people are saying 10 seconds from visual to landing nail biting is what Josh said. So I guess we picked a good one. The weather, the weather got worse since we took off, it seems like. Because the clouds were at 1700 AGL, but they're saying that they're like at under 100 AGL. Oh, 400 feet, okay. So 400 feet, is that 400 AGL or 400 MSL? The elevation of the airport is 335. So that gives us uh, like 535, right? Okay, 580. Our minimums are at 580 for this approach. The NOTAM says the DM, he's out of service. I would be crazy if the flight sim um, took NOTAMs into account and like uh, kicked you out of restricted airspace and stuff like that too. If there's like a TFR as well, that'd be really cool. Okay, so it's completing our procedure turn right now. We just went, we're coming inbound now. So we're about to be at this random waypoint. This isn't part of the procedure. I think this is something to do with the Garmin programming. Um, where it's the end of our procedure turn. And then from there, we're going to go down 200 more feet to the final approach fix. So I'm going to arm approach mode already. I'm just going to hit approach mode right here. Oh, and it just switched automatically. Awesome. So the G1000 just automatically switched everything for us. It's actually almost to be on the glide path right now. So it automatically switched us to localizer. If it doesn't do that automatically, you can manually switch by hitting the CDI soft key down here to change to localizer one or localizer two. Okay, now it's capturing the glide slope. So the glide slope was captured early. We're not even at the final approach fix yet. The final approach fix is where we're supposed to capture it, but in Microsoft Flight Sim, it seems to capture it sooner than that normally before the final approach fix. I'm going to, because we're descending now, I'm going to pull our throttle out and we're going to give it in a few, in a few seconds here, I'm going to go uh, rich mixture. All right. So it says 29 knot crosswind. This is, this is horrible. It's going to get slower as we get lower. So we'll have to keep our eyes on that. All right. If I go back to the chart, so here we are. So we're going for ILS runway one five in Burlington. Final approach course is 146. So we're on that right now. We're headed towards the runway right here, runway 15. We are on the localizer already. Localizer frequency is up here, 110.3. And the identifier code right there, IBTV. All of that was put in earlier automatically for us, but we can verify that right here. 110.3, IBTV, that's the identifier, checks out. We're already on the localizer, so we're lined up lining up with the runway. And you can see that the autopilot is crabbing us into the wind automatically. It's aiming to the right because of that crosswind from the right. So that's keeping our flight path marker right here, this green crosshair symbol. That's basically our, our kind of the resulting direction we're actually traveling through the air relative to, um, and kind of, it's not relative to the ground, it's through the air, but this is basically showing where we're gonna end up on the ground if you look at it. So you can see how the autopilot's nudging the marker over towards that runway more. We can see the synthetic view of the runway right there. So that's what it's trying to do is it's compensating for the wind automatically using the localizer to line us up laterally with the runway. So you see how the flight pack path marker is right over near the runway. So it's gonna waver here and there as the wind is so crazy and gusty right now. But um, that's how you can use the flight path marker as an indicator when you have crosswind to compensate for it. You can look at this to know if you're compensating for the wind correctly left or right and you're still on target with the runway. All right, so that's the outer ILS marker and we're passing over the final approach fix right now. So now our next one is the missed approach point. We're not gonna go miss, we're just gonna land this because it's gonna be fun and for the, for the sake of time. If you're flying something that, yeah, if you're flying something that doesn't have the synthetic vision, doesn't have the G1000, basically you're, stare, you're staring not at this nice terrain that's being shown here for us, but you're staring at the needles here. You're staring at these uh, to make sure that you are 
um, to make sure that these needles are centered. So you would be looking at the glide slope here, the diamond, and something I've recently related this to using the NXI is the left side is our airspeed, right? And your left hand is generally on the yoke, uh, assuming you're in the left seat. On the right here is our altitude, and our altitude during our descent here is, we wanna think of it related to power, and our right hand is on the throttle. So on the left side, if you need to make an adjustment to your airspeed, left side of the NXI, think left hand. Left hand is the yoke or your stick. So if you want to adjust your airspeed, you need to pitch up or down. So you use your left hand to adjust the airspeed. If you want to change your rate of descent, that's a throttle change. You change your engine power. So if we need to descend more like we do right now, you pull throttle out. So if the diamond's above, add throttle. If the diamond's below, remove throttle. All on the right side, right hand on the throttle, right hand up or down, mattering if the diamond's up or down. So you can kind of map those in like that. All right, sorry, we're getting uh, really close to landing and I'm just blabbering, so I'm slowing down big time now. Um, we're at nine knots on the crosswind. Our minimums, we're at 780 on the altitude. We have 200 feet more before minimums. It's not gonna call them out audibly, so I'm gonna keep my eye on that. So 580 feet, we're at 680 right now. So we have 100 feet to go before we need to see the runway. And according to everyone else, they basically were barely able to see it, so. In real life, if we hit the minimums like we're about to, and we can't see the runway... Actually, we see the runway right now. I see it and we're at minimums. So we see the lighting, so we're good. We're barely good. This is... insane. There's the rabbit leading us in. Um, we would go mist on this. Okay, I'm watching my throttle. Pulling my throttle. Sorry, I was talking so much I was getting distracted from actually landing. I'm bouncing a little bit. There we go. Wow, that was really close <laughs> at the end. Uh, yeah, I put, my I put my flaps out a little bit just in time. Sorry, I was so busy talking to you guys that I'm not paying attention to how close to the runway we are. XD. Um, so anyway, realistically, so we had the minimum set there. We didn't have a clear, I didn't have a clear visual of the runway. I saw like the rabbit lights, basically the lights that lead up to the threshold of the runway in this case. Um, I could barely see those. So realistically, we would have done the missed approach procedure because it's just too insane. Um, but yeah, just, you know, for fun, we just go down anyway. <laughs> right on hotel, left on golf. Uh, yeah, that was insane. That was, uh, a good landing. Thanks, Sim Aviation. I think that was pretty sketchy. I was, uh... I was talking way too much. We need to, I need to insert like a chat in the Aviate Communicate Navigate or Aviate Navigate Communicate uh, checklist. It should be chat, YouTube chat, Aviate Navigate Communicate. Apparently those are my priorities. Um, yeah, that is, uh, that was ridiculous. That was way too low visibility. Like I could barely see uh, the lighting system leading up to the runway. Uh, we should have that that would be a missed approach. I am 99% sure that would be a missed approach uh, That was kind of terrifying um, What's really cool though is uh, and I went over this in the last stream or two streams ago. I did missed approach procedures um, But the missed approach is part of this if you did fly the missed approach you would fly runway heading You would do that based off the chart here. So the missed approach instructions are written at the top here climb to 800 feet Climbing right turn to 3,000 feet and then direct to the Burlington VOR. So that's shown down here. And this dashed line points to your missed approach. This is basically your missed approach procedure. 
Um, so typically you stay runway heading and climb to a certain altitude first before making a turn. And that's um, a safety altitude. That'll actually be shown, even if it's not part of the procedure, that'll be shown here in the missed approach procedure. Sometimes it's part of the procedure and sometimes it's not. In this case, you can see it matches. Climb to 800 feet matches the 800 feet here. So this is our altitude that we need to reach before making our turn towards our missed approach point, which is this missed approach holding point right here. And that's where we do the hold. Um, so sometimes if the missed approach procedure, the, the missed approach procedure may say something like climb to 3000. And that's not necessarily an, uh, the safe altitude. The Garmin will actually also show the safe altitude. So it'll show you a calculated altitude um, to climb to before making a first turn. Even if the procedure doesn't have that same altitude, it'll still show you that for a reference here. I wish I could see the nameplates when you guys are close up. This is this actually looks awesome right now too. The just the lighting and the, the way the sun's coming through the clouds looks amazing. All right, we should do another one of these. Flaps up, lean the mixture for taxing and contact ground 126.3. Thanks, Gabriel. Yeah, let's, um, we should all park. Um, I'm just gonna do it through the ATC menu, request taxi to parking. Yep, 123, oh, he said 126.3. For me, it's showing 123.8 here. I don't know if he was being serious. And then acknowledge the taxi clearance. And just so I know, uh, you know, the Microsoft Flight Sim taxiways are pretty much always incorrectly named. So if you do want to actually go where it's telling you to go um, and have it match up, uh, you want to go to assistance options under here and turn on the taxi ribbon. I kind of go back and forth. Uh, it's here under navigation aids, taxi ribbon. I go back and forth between having this on or off, mattering if I'm using like Volanta or if I'm using ForeFlight. Both of those, um, Volanta, for example, has good taxiway diagrams. I don't have it loaded up just now because I actually just re reformatted my entire computer and put Windows 11 on and all that. Uh, but Volanta, I'll, I'll put it in the chat actually. Um, it's a good free alternative if you don't have any of these other tools for a moving map. Uh, personal flight tracker. There we go. So I just put a link to Volanta or Volanta. Hey, Trimont, really bad weather here. I guess you can't see you on the field. I'm not in your flight group. Uh, we don't have a group going, Trimont. We just have it set to all players. So make sure you set the multiplayer options to all players and that you're on the USA West server, and then you should be able to see us. It's just easier to do all players than it is to start a group with everyone because you have to add each other as friends and all that stuff. All right, so let's, um, if you want to get credit for the flight in your logbook, you should taxi over to the parking. So yeah, hang a left here and then just follow along this way. Oh, little nav map, yeah. Little nav map is also free and very popular. I think Volanta Volanta's nicer to look at, but it doesn't have nearly as many features as Little Nav Map. Little Nav Map is has a ton of features, um, and I'm not really familiar with it just because I find myself using Navigraph and ForeFlight a lot. I do need to uh, learn Little Nav Map just because it's so popular. People seem to really love it. So, um, Volanta or Volanta is a free one as well, and that'll give you a moving map. What's nice about that one is when you zoom all the way into the airports, you'll get taxiway information. So if you want to get taxiway info, that's a, a good app to use. It'll also show you multiplayer traffic and it'll track your flights. Um, so you basically have a logbook through it, which is pretty cool too. Um, but yeah, if you want the logbook um, within the sim to count your flight, you just need to go over to a parking spot and turn off the engines and turn off the av avionics. Um, so in the Cessna 172, you can do that really quickly just by pulling the mixture 
and then turning avionics bus number one and two off. Those are the white switches on the left side over here. You just turn those two switches off and then that'll count it in your flight sim log book. And you should be able to go to any parking spot. Uh, you could just pull up to any gate. Sometimes I'll just pull up to where there's an, a plane parked already, um, you know, like a computer generated plane and you could just park there. Um, and as soon as you shut it down, um, it should give you credit. So put the parking brake on. And another thing you can do is hit, um, if you've ever used control E to start up the engine on PC, you can use um, shift control E to turn off the engine. That's another shortcut. Um, but that'll just, yeah, stop the engine. And then you just hit the two avionics switches. It matters what plane you're flying, but look for, look for the avionics switches. Uh, in whichever plane you're on, you're flying in. And then you should get this logbook entry like this. So it logs your flight in your flight sim logbook. Then I'm going to hit control E again and then start up the plane. Um, actually, I can't. Unfortunately, I can't do this. So normally you would you could clear out the flight plan and replan it. But if you want air traffic control, then unfortunately right now, this is not going to work. If you program in like this from scratch, air traffic control is not going to know about it. Um, hopefully we'll have that in the future. So uh, to do the next flight plan, I'll have to exit to the main menu and do it through the world map. Uh, Michael says, when I put in waypoints for a plan, do I enter them from arrival to departure or vice versa? I usually enter the departure airport and the arrival airport first, and then I fill in the on route section and then pick a procedure if I want to preload an, an arrival, a departure, an approach, if I want to load those. But I, I would recommend putting in the origin or departure airport first then putting in the arrival airport second and then doing everything else because at the very least it's going to give you um, it's going to conveniently automatically load the procedures at say you choose a, um, a departure procedure or a SID from your procedures menu it's going to automatically select your departure airport for you so you don't have to put in that waypoint again and same with the arrival when you choose a star or you choose an approach it'll automatically put the arrival airport first uh, so you don't, it'll just save you some time. All right, so let's take off from Burlington again, and let's find another nearby airport. So I'm selecting Burlington. If you guys want ATC again, and you want ATC to assign you an approach to fly, you're going to have to come back to the world map and redo this. In the future, uh, with some more updates to the NXI, I'm sure they're going to work on this later on. And you can do this with the stock uh, G1000 still, you can program it in manually in the NXI without coming back to the world map, and then it'll let you contact ATC, get a new IFR clearance, and then take off without having to come back into the world map. But if you're using the NXI for now, you have to do it all through the world map if you want ATC to work correctly. Uh, for you guys that haven't joined and want to join on the second flight, all you have to do here on the world map, in the top right, go to your name up here. And then make sure you choose West USA for your server. So you can just hit West USA and then close that. And then the second thing is here under flight conditions, choose all players right here. And this is just, this just simplifies things. So if people that join the flight don't want to deal with the rain or the low, the clouds and stuff like that, they want it to be pretty or they want it to be night instead of day or vice versa. Using all players means that everyone that's in that area, they can use whatever time of day and whatever weather settings they want to use. I happen to be using live. Um, so if you want to do what, exactly what I'm doing, do all players and do live. And if you want to customize, do all players, and then you can choose preset or custom and change the weather as you wish. And what's cool is um, right here, actually, if you choose live weather, you're not locked in to live weather when you're in the game. I can still turn off live weather in the game as long as I'm on all players. So the key is to use all players. Hey Jacques, awesome, thanks for joining. Yeah, let's do one more. Um, if you guys wanna join for the second one, love to fly along again. We can do another crazy approach. 
So I'm going to take a look. I do have four flight up on my iPad right now on the side. So I'm going to find something nearby. It looks like a lot of the weather nearby is uh, IFR right now. Let's see here to the west. Adriandak. Adriandak, am I saying that right? Saranac Lake in New York to the west. KSLK. This says it's IFR with... 1,200 feet overcast, broken at 800 feet. That sounds good. KSLK. I think we should fly the Grand Caravan this time. KSLK. So the Saranac Lake out to the west. Whoops. Uh, I chose the wrong one. There, I'll flip that. There we go. And let me see. Uh, let me see the estimated time if we choose the Grand Caravan. 16 minutes. I think that's that's way too fast. Um, air traffic off. Yeah, I had the I had the air traffic off just so I only see multiplayer players. Um, if you want to include live traffic as well, you can. But you know, when there's like 20 of us flying together, I like just simplifying it and just only seeing the multiplayer traffic. But this is if you want the um, AI air traffic, so like fake faked, um, you know, airliner flights or f um, live traffic based ones. These are live traffic routes. So real world flights are injected in. So it's not just made up by the computer. It's actually made up of real world flight plans. Um, but yeah, you can turn that off if you only want to see multiplayer. So I, I have it in that case, all off and live. If you want to see every person from Flight Sim and all the live traffic injected in from real world flights, you can also do that uh, this way. It can just get really busy. It's up to you. It also clutters up ATC quite a bit. Um, yeah, I think this is a little too close for um, for the 208. We're going to get there really fast. Let me pick something a little bit further. I'm just doing I'm doing a little research here on. Uh... Oh, this one's pretty good. This is single runway KPTD. KPTD. Okay, this one's 80 nautical miles. This gives us a little more time. And this one's also IFR. It's a slightly smaller airport. It has a single runway, but it's 3,700 feet. So this will be enough for us in the Grand Caravan. I want to try, I want to do the Grand Caravan. I, I'm a big fan of the Grand Caravan as somebody that is a bit intimidated even by like the Bonanzas and the Arrows. Um, because I haven't learned about how to handle the constant speed prop and set the uh, set the propeller speed correctly for the different phases of flight, that's still kind of an kind of intimidating to me. Um, but what's nice about the Grand Caravan is the operation is pretty simple, um, where you can just set the fuel condition and the prop to maximum. Basically, it's not good like technic. You know, it's not it's not realistic per se for the engine. Like people would pull it back to make the fuel economy better and to lessen the stress on the engine. But as far as the sim and keeping it casual, you can just leave them, um, leave them at hundred percent and it'll be fine. Um, so here, because it's a turbo prop, you know, instead of a mixture, we have a fuel condition lever and then we have our, um, we have our propeller speed, our RPMs here for our prop. And we can just leave those at hundred percent. Some people, it sounds like they'll pull them back um, a few hundred RPM lower during flight. But from what I read, generally, the prop speed has really changed, you know, um, for noise issues. So re to reduce the cabin noise or to reduce the noise, um, the ambient noise, like the, the noise being created by the airplane. If there's, um, you know, sound abatements or sound laws in certain airports and things like that, in those cases, they would pull the prop back to reduce the noise. But you know, we're not really worried about that in the sim, so we can just leave them at 100%. But I think the Grand Caravan is awesome to fly as a, as a kind of a first step up after a smaller plane like the 172 or the SR-22. It's a little bit faster. It goes a lot higher. It has anti-icing. It has oxygen. You can, if you're doing um, anything like on-air company or you're doing NeoFly and things like that, it carries more cargo and passengers. Um, it's still, to me, very straightforward to fly. 
Um, so I think it's a really good plane to move to from the 172, from the Diamond DA40, from the, from the Sirius. Actually, I, th I think the Sirius is a little more intimidating just because it's so fast. Um, anyway, let's go back to Burlington. I'm going to fly the Grand Caravan this time. I would totally encourage you guys, if you haven't flown the turboprop, try the Grand Caravan. Um, and you can do the TBM afterwards if you want. The TBM is a rocket ship, though. The Grand Caravan is much slower than like the TBM. Um, yeah, cruise speed in 195. We're usually at like, I feel like we're usually at like 150, 160 uh, with this. Whereas the TBM, you're going to be going um, much faster it would be going like 250 instead of 150 or at least at least over 200 so anyway i would recommend grand caravan if you want to give it a shot and then i'm going to pick a ramp here to start in so again if you guys are joining usa west choose all players and you can do whatever you want for the rest you can do live traffic if you want you can choose your own weather and time and then departure we're leaving from burlington and going to Potsdam. This is to the west. I guess this is in Potsdam, New York. I'm not familiar with the area, but it's a short flight, 80 miles. And then that's KPTD. I'll type both of these in the chat. KBTV to KPTD. So Papa Tango Delta. And then again, to make sure that air traffic control assigns us an approach, we're going to play that game where they assign us an approach and we fly it. Make sure to choose an IFR flight type up here in the top left. Um, we could do high altitude in the caravan. It's such a short flight that we're not going to even climb that high. So again, I'm going to choose low altitude airways. Uh, what's the ceiling? 25? Yeah, 25,000 is the ceiling for the Grand Caravan. So you can get into the flight levels. Um, it can take a while to climb that high in the Grand Caravan, but um technically yeah the service ceiling is you can get into the flight level so up to flight level 250 so if you do have a long haul that you're doing the caravan you can choose high altitude airways to get up that high so we'll choose low altitude and again i'm i picked a ramp i'm gonna leave the approach on automatic oh we only have one approach available actually let me i hope uh i hope this has hope this approach has vertical guidance otherwise I might be shooting myself in the foot here it does not. This is a straight in approach. This is an LNAV approach. And the minimums are 880, so 406. Oh man, this is a this is either a bad idea or a good idea. <laughs> Given the weather at that airport airport, we would never fly this. We would we would not fly this because it's IFR. I think we might need to go east. Sorry to change it up. I think we might need to go east to get... Yeah, we need to divert, I think. I think we need one that has... We, we need some procedures with better minimums. Otherwise, we're not going to get down. Uh, that's an LNAV as well. I'm just looking at my iPad right now. Two airports to the west. Oh, these guys over here. Yeah, let's check. Okay, I can check these. Oh, is this one up in Canada, it looks like? What's this? KGTB? This is quite a bit further though. That's the only problem is I don't want to I don't want you guys to have to hang around for an hour plus during doing a flight. Um let's go up to our neighbors in the north in Canada and see what we got here. Montreal. Oh yeah, 30 minutes for Montreal. Oh yeah, we got a ton of approach types here. But obviously, yeah, Montreal, this is a major airport. This might work. Let me check out. Actually, on four flight, I do not have Montreal. So let me look this up in Navigraph. What's really, I know I, I talk about Navigraph pretty often. I, I have no association with them or with anyone, but Navigraph, if you can afford the annual subscription, it is amazing because you get, you get global Jeppesen charts, um, obviously just for flight sim use, because these will be outdated. Um, you can see this chart right here is from April 2021, so this might not even be the latest one. Um, anyway, let's try this. CYMX. CYMX. And I'm just going to look at the approaches here real quick to make sure we have minimums. I'm sure we will because it's a major airport. So we have ILS approaches. Here's an IL. So we have an ILS for one, two, three different runways have ILS approaches. 
And then we also have RNAV approaches. There's even an ILS CAT2 approach here. Um, we've been flying CAT1 ILS approaches, but this CAT2 ILS approach, look at the minimums on this thing, 100 feet AGL. So this is like a uh, CAT2 like airliner ILS approach. Um, so yeah, we'll be good on the minimums here. We'll fly just the regular ILS or the regular RNAV approach. So yeah, we have 200 feet. Here again, we have an LPV. So this is the RNAV for runway 06. It is a WAS approach, LPV. And here we have 200 feet AGL as well. Oh, that's uh, the original chart. Oh, got it, Casey. Oh, they are current, cool. I just assumed when they say for simulation use, I mean, obviously that's for liability um, as well, um, but, and you know, their agreement with Jeppesen, but I assume that some of these are out of date. <laughs> All right, yeah, this one, this one's great. We have a lot of different approach types here. We'll go up to Montreal. We'll vi visit our neighbors in the north, neighbors to the north, and uh, yeah, we'll go here up, up to Montreal. So KBTV. Sorry, I'll retype this again. Kilo Bravo Tango Victor to Charlie Yankee Mike X-Ray, and then make sure again you choose IFR on the top left. Make sure you have IFR chosen because we want air traffic control to give us an approach. They'll assign us an approach. And now if you guys also remember, you can choose your own approach. If there's one of these you really want to do, say the last flight you did an RNAV, but you really want to do an ILS this time, you can go ahead and force a specific approach. It might not be the best approach for the runway you're choosing based on the weather. Um, let me take a look at the weather up there right now. Real world weather says that the winds are all variable at five knots, it looks like. So it's kind of hard to say which runway. Anyway, I'm going to leave this on automatic and they'll surprise us. Loading in at the gate. Um, it did choose a departure for us here automatically for me. Um, so I'm going to actually for once take a look at the departure procedure. Um, I don't always have a departure procedure. And I'm still learning quite a bit about these myself, but it looks like we have Burlington 1, Runway 33, Departure. So the same way you bring up your approach diagrams, your approach plates, you can look up uh, using Navigraph or similar. You can look up the departure or the SIDS or the DPs, the departure procedure charts as well. Um, and this is where you see, you know, in the, in the case of this one, it's a SID. It's a IFR departure procedure or it could be a um, ODP, an obstacle departure procedure at a smaller airport, one that doesn't have a full-on instrument departure procedure. Um, so here it's choosing runway 33 for us for our departure. So here we can look at our takeoff notes and our takeoff instructions for runway 33 um, here at Burlington. So in this case down here, we can see in this small text, you, you guys can barely read, um, it says runway 33, Obstacle notes are here that there's a pole and trees beginning at 971 feet from DER. That's the departure end of the runway. So, um, so when we when we take off and we cross over the departure end of the runway, beginning at 971 feet from there, it says 755 feet left to center line, up to 97 AGL. So, like if for some reason we didn't climb 100 feet and that 800 feet or, or actually 971 feet. So if for some reason we didn't climb that, this would be an obstacle we would be concerned with. Um, I'm not as familiar with departure procedures as I am approach stuff yet, but this is where all of the specs are, all of the procedures are for our departure that it's choosing for us. And then at the bottom, it shows um, our ground speed and our required rate of climb per nautical mile. So this is giving us performance information based on our aircraft. So we have to be able to meet certain standards for climbing at a certain rate in order to be able to actually execute the departure procedure. If we weren't able to climb at these rates in this little table, I know you guys can barely see the table. Um, I can't zoom in anymore, um, but it's showing us performance information here. And then at the bottom, it just says initial climb, climb on assigned heading for radar vectors to the filed nav aid. So this is stuff that we won't have vectors from air traffic control necessarily. Um, they'll just tell us an altitude. So we're just going to climb on our assigned heading and then we'll follow the procedure that's programmed into the NXI. 
um, to the to the file Navade. So it'll have one in for us. And where is the Navade for runway 33? Standard or lower? Minimum climb of 340 feet per nautical mile. And then here on the map view, it's showing all of the navades. So it, it's just saying to assign heading to the filed navid. So that would be the navigation aid that's part of our flight plan then to the to the filed navid. So anyway, we just climb on our assigned heading and within the sim air traffic control, they're going to give us when they give us our clearance, they'll give us our climb and maintain altitude. VFR Aviation says suggest a straight out departure of 33. So that's what it looks like it's assigned me here automatically. So if you guys are already loaded in and yeah, you're confirming that's good. That's what it's choosing here is runway 33. All right, I'm finally going to load in. Um, BTV sends you south first. Yeah, so here it just says standard minimum climb rate 340 per nautical mile to 5,900 feet. So runway 33, we climb runway heading to 5,900 feet. Whoa, it's so dark. All right, I might... Do we fly in the dark? Maybe we should fly in the dark. Sometimes it's fun. Uh, I mean, you want to get... You want to do IFR. I mean, we'll do it in the dark and in the clouds. All right, using the checklist here. Um, if you guys are in the Grand Caravan and you have the checklist... The startup procedure is really fast. Um, these are very small checklists compared to the 172. So you just need to put the fuel selector on. If you are in the darkness like this, you can't see anything at all. You can always just press L on your keyboard. Why is it not working for me? Oh, the battery is not on. Wait, that's weird. It should turn on a flashlight. Um, you can press L to turn all the lights on. If you if all the lights are off and the battery is off, hit Alt L. So the left Alt key and L will turn on a flashlight. And so that's how you can look around for the fuel selectors, which are up here. And then the battery light, which is down here on the bottom left, you have your battery. So once you turn on the battery and the fuel selectors, you can just hit L to turn on all the interior lights. It'll just toggle all of them on and off. And then if you guys are new to the Grand Caravan, when you're on the ground, you can put these two to low idle and to like the middle position. So turn the RPMs lower um, for taxiing and stuff. Otherwise, oh, it looks like, oh, right. They broke, they kind of broke this. Fuel condition lever does not work with the mixture. So you actually have to, you can see this as a switch. It's, sw it's basically acting like a switch instead of a lever. So when I'm pointing at it, I use my mouse to move it from low idle to high idle. And so when we're taxiing, we can set it to low idle. Um, anyway, yeah, I forgot the mixture doesn't work correctly in the Grand Caravan. Um, another thing you can do is if you don't want to run through the checklist and you're on PC, you can hit control E and that will do a startup for the engine. Uh, Dale's asking, how do I set the altitude? We'll do that in just a second with the autopilot. First thing we're going to do is contact clearance. So because we started from the world map and we chose an IFR flight plan, ATC, it's going to let us request that clearance with ATC. So up here, go to ATC. And then we go to clearance. We have a clearance delivery frequency here. And then we click request IFR clearance. And they'll give us our climb to altitude, probably 5,900 if it follows the departure procedure. Over here is our altitude selection knob. All right, runway 33, climb and maintain 8,000 feet. And then it'll remember our departure frequency and it'll automatically change our transponder. So we just read this back. Cessna November 2, 1 Kilo, India Papa, cleared to Mirabel Airport. Okay, so they said to climb and maintain 8,000 feet. If you're on PC, uh, the command, con the shortcut control 2 is very useful. This will zoom in to show you most of the autopilot up here. And you can also see enough over here on the left to turn it, to dial in your altitude and stuff. So I like to hit control 2 for this instrument view. 
And now we have our altitude selection right here. So we're gonna, I'm gonna roll my mouse wheel and you can see that in view over here on the PFD is our selected altitude. So we're gonna keep rolling that to 8,000 cause that's the instruction they gave us is to climb and maintain 8,000. So I'm just rolling this or you can click and drag if you're using the new control setup, the new lock style controls. So I set that to 8,000 right over here. And we know we're in crappy weather this whole time. I'm going to turn next rat off just to clean this up. And it looks like our first waypoint as part of the departure procedure is actually taking us really far south here to the Albany VOR, it looks like. Or Albany. I said Albany. Albany. That's turning us quite... Of taking us 108 nautical miles to the south. Uh, we're not going to fly that whole thing. Um, I'm going to leave that programmed in, but let's just all get off the ground. And then once we're uh, in our climb, we're just going to make a right hand turn and we're going to head directly over to this YJN Yankee Juliet November waypoint. We're going to just make a right hand turn to save time. We're not going to do this. This is a hundred miles out of the way. Uh, yeah, we're not going to do that. So I don't know why it chose this departure procedure for us. Um, yeah, so we're going to... You could delete it right now. You could go into procedures. Uh, or sorry, is it under menu? Under menu and remove departure down here. That's one way to get rid of the departure procedure. So to do that, you open flight plan. You turn on the cursor by pushing FMS. So it should be flashing. Then you hit menu. And this is where you can remove the departure procedure. We're going to leave that. I'm going to leave that alone just because I also want to show you guys once we take off how to just we'll turn manually and then we'll go direct to we'll just activate this waypoint next. Um, so just so I can show that in the NXI, I'll leave this departure procedure in. you can take it out if you want to. But we're going to take off and uh, we'll just make a right hand turn using autopilot with heading mode. All right, let's so continue. Let's continue to set up the autopilot. So over here, we have our speeds. We have our V speeds right here is our rotation speed. So if you haven't flown the Grand Caravan before, rotation speeds at 70. And then here, our best rate of climb is 95. So we're going to put those in. I'm going to hit Control 2 again to go to this view. And I'm going to hit, uh, we have our altitude in at 8,000 already. Now I'm going to hit flight level change for the climb. And you can see again, conveniently on the left side, we can see this FLC right over here in green text. This is still visible. Uh, this is not by accident that you can still see this when you are in this camera preset. So FLC, we wanna turn that using this vertical knob right here. See where it says down up. This vertical knob is for our pitch and for our flight level change and for vertical speed modes. So all we do is roll that to the down position. You actually roll the wheel to the to up, kind of like you're pushing this stick up or pushing the yoke in. So that would pitch the nose down. You can see it says down there. That would increase our speed. So as a result, flight level change, the knots over here is going up. So we're going to turn that all the way up to 95. I'm just using my mouse wheel while I'm pointing at it. There's 65, 70, 75. I'm just keeping it, looking at the corner of my screen over here where it says 95. So now we have 95 in here for our flight level change. All right, so we're set up there. I'm also gonna change to heading mode. And we know we're taking off from runway 33, so I'm just gonna use the heading bug to change that to 330. It'll be a little bit off. Once we line up on the runway, we'll sync it to our direct heading, so it's a little more precise. But as an estimate, we can put in, you just put a zero on the end of the runway number, that gives you the rough magnetic heading of the runway. So 33 is 330. All right, and I'm going to turn off some of these lights here. We have our landing lights on. I don't need those right now. Turn the cabin lights off. Wing light can go off. And it looks like we have our pedo heat is on, which is fine. It's going to get cold once we take off, once we get higher up. Um, and then all these lights that are on, there are all of these uh, knobs down here. Here are the floodlights. Whoops. That's the inertial separator, but we just leave that in. If I can click here. Oh my god. <laughs> Alright, I can do it. I can't do it. 
All right, there we go. Control four. That looks like a better one. I'm going to turn these floodlights off. And then here we have avionics and standby instruments. So there's standby instruments. The third one here, are all these lights on the side for our switches. All right, there we go. So if you want to mess with these with all the lighting, you can do that. Um, control four, that's a good hotkey to get down to these. Now that I'm done with that, what I'm going to do is turn off my flashlight. So I do that with left alt and L. So that toggles your flashlight alt L. L for light. All right, there we go. And um, the brightness on these, they're actually controlled in two ways. The, the G1000 NXI has its own brightness settings under the menu. Um, so if you go over here under the menu, there are brightness settings on the left display, the PFD. But also this avionics knob down here also controls it. So this is a quicker way to do it. So you can uh, adjust that to your liking to match the uh, outside lights, however you like to do it. All right, that's a lot of talking. So now we need to get the weather. So let's tune into the ATIS. So I'm just going to go to ATC, tune into the Burlington ATIS. This is how we get the cloud information. We get our altimeter. And if you don't want to do this, you can just press B on your keyboard to set the altimeter. 600 feet broken clouds. That's awesome. 2947. All right, ILS 15 in use, but landing runway 33. I don't know how that works, but all right, we'll switch back to ground now. So to change our altimeter, um, you just grab this barrow knob right here, the outer one where it says barrow, and you can just turn that. And then I hit B just to make sure I didn't forget. <laughs> Two nine or four seven is the altimeter. And you can just hit B as a shortcut if you don't want to do all that manually. All right, so now let's get our taxi instructions. So once again on ATC, request taxi for our IFR departure. All right, our taxi lights are on, our beacon, our strobe is on. I know these rules vary from country to country. We were talking about this a, lip, a little bit another stream whether you have your strobe on or not. I think some people said in, in certain countries, like or in Canada or in the US, it's different, but sometimes you have the strobe on, sometimes you have the nav lights on. I'm just gonna leave them all on. I'll just play both sides and then I'll turn my taxi lights on. Landing lights are still off until we're on the runway or crossing a runway. All right, and then... Yes, so I'll acknowledge that. Acknowledge the taxi clearance. You can also hit just hit one on your keyboard to reply to these if you know that one is the response number. You can just hit the response number without even opening the window, which is really convenient. Okay, so our propeller is at max right now. I'm just going to leave it there to simplify things. And before we take off, we're going to turn this fuel condition from low idle to high idle. And then we just leave those. After that, we're just going to use our throttle. All right. Parking brake is off, and let's see, do we have a we have a taxi ribbon over there? So I know we're all at different parking spots, so we're just gonna taxi over and meet at 3-3. You guys are probably already there. And if you have a yoke or a stick that has a hat button on it that is set to use all the presets like this, like glance left and glance right, you can hit up on that. That'll give you like a takeoff and landing and taxiing view, which I use all the time. All right, so we just use the throttle. We're in low idle on the fuel condition still. And just follow the taxi ribbon. If you do not have the taxi ribbon, I recommend it just because there's a lot of errors in the taxiways in Microsoft Flight Sim. So even if they tell you, they'll tell you uh, um, a taxiway that doesn't even exist sometimes. We're going to ignore that just because there are billions of us. And because it just does that sometimes. Um, but you can turn on the taxi ribbon by going to the assistance options. So if you hit escape or go to your main menu, go to assistance, and then under the navigation aids, turn on taxi, uh, taxi ribbon, and you'll get this. And I'm going to hit one on my keyboard to reply to him.
All right, so for this one, we're going to take off, and then we're going to, once we're up a little bit, we're going to make a right-hand turn to head north up to Montreal. We're not going to fly this departure procedure because we don't need to triple the length of this flight for no reason. Um, I think in general, like, I don't really use departure procedures much because I'm not flying long-haul flights um, or flights that are in the flight levels. So if you do fly airliners, you're going to run into f using departure procedures and using um, at least the SIDs, the instrument departure procedures, and the STARS, which are the arrivals. You're going to end up using those pretty often um, if you're flying much longer distances. But because I fly a lot of the small planes, I don't even fly a long enough distance to use those because, as you can see in this case, this departure procedure puts us 100 miles south of the airport when we're going north. It makes... It made no sense to choose this one, and in general, you don't have you don't use these SIDs because they're so far off your course that it just doesn't make sense. We would just fly a direct route mostly. Doing some responsible speed uh taxing here. I better better increase my speed. Break some rules. And you guys have been waiting forever. Sorry about that. I know you guys are super patient for just chilling out over here while I'm just talking for 15 minutes. So thanks for thanks for hanging out and waiting. I appreciate it. Weedman 077. All right, you got your 208. Looks like everybody here is in 208s. Cerebral Pear and Subdued Rat in their 208s. I love all the liveries on the 208 too. Oh, Hound Dog says, anytime you have visible moisture, turn on pedo heat. I have mine on. Actually, my switch does work. I've uh, been adding more switches, using more switches on my Bravo. Pedo heat is a must have. Um, electric fuel pump is a must have. Parking brake is a must have, I think. That's a good rule to know. Thanks, Hound Dog. And we're at 13 degrees Celsius, but yeah, it's going to get colder when we get up there. So we're climbing to 8,000. We're going to climb on runway heading, and then we're all going to make a right-hand turn um, onto what would have been our more direct course. We're basically going to go direct to our second waypoint once we get up. Um, I, do, I didn't do that yet. I didn't remove the departure procedure because I want to show you guys how to just override the waypoints by using direct to or by using activate legs. So we'll do that. Two oh eight train. Oh yeah, there's a there's a good six or eight of us it looks like. And hey, there's a few guys that already took off. I see Trimons out there already with the SR twenty two. Aviator SoCal is up there in his caravan. He just took off. I see Endgame also. All right, so yeah, we're at 320 feet on the ground, climbing to 8,000. And let me check the runway heading specifically. Runway 33, magnetic heading 326. So I'm gonna dial in. 326 on the heading here. And then what we're going to do is change our fuel condition lever here to high idle. So you just click and drag it up there. It acts more like a switch than a lever since the last update. Uh, so we're going to turn this to high idle. And then flaps, I'm going to put into the center position, which is the takeoff position. There's a flap lever right here. It's only got three positions. We have retracted, takeoff, and then landing. So I have it in the center position for takeoff. All right, I'm just going to do a rolling takeoff. Our rotation here is again at 70 knots. All right, so just make sure your propeller is fully forward. Make sure that your fuel condition is in high idle. And then, you know the procedure. Full throttle and wait for rotation and then pull back. And then fly runway heading. 
And so we're looking for 70 knots in this guy. There's 60, there's 70, and we're up super fast. The Grand Caravan is just awesome. Like, this thing is so great um, for flying on short runways and dirt and grass runways. It's pretty amazing. And now you can see that the uh, temperature here is yelling at us, so I'm going to pull the throttle back just a little bit until we get into the green. There we go. It's probably like at 95% or so on the throttle just to get out of that red, uh, that red critical area there for, um, for our torque. All right, and then they said to, oh, whoops, <laughs> I was not cleared to take off. I'm smart. Oh no, did I mess up the whole thing? Oh no, I think I messed up the entire thing. <laughs> oh, sh oh no. Oh, I think it canceled my IFR. Oh my God. All right, I'm just gonna fly. I'm gonna fly and have to listen to you guys, I think. Yeah, if I go to approach now, all it's doing is letting me request a class C airspace transition. All right, hold on. I'm gonna catch up to you guys. You guys keep going. I'm gonna catch up. Um, return to the main menu. Did I program anything crazy? I didn't. All right, I'm going to return to the main menu. I, I messed up by not contacting the tower, so it canceled my IFR clearance. So that means that it would not, it's not going to assign me an approach. So I'm going to redo this in lightning speed here up to Montreal. Whoops. Whoops, CYMX. Here we go. IFR, departure 33. And I'm running, I'm starting right on the runway. There we go. Um, oh, you can resubmit. It, it'll let you resubmit. Oh, would it have? Anyway, I'm just restarting to... I know this will work, so I'm just restarting on the runway. I'll just do my takeoff again. Redo IFR after you request flight following. Oh, no. All right, I messed up. After you request flight following, it works. Well, you guys are teaching me about ATC. I guess I didn't, I didn't know that. I'm going to set this up as fast as possible. Climb and maintain 8,000. 8,000, runway heading, sync, heading mode, flight level change. I feel like I'm uh, doing a speed run right now. Flight level change, 95 knots, good. Pedo heat is on, pump is on, parking brake is off, applying brakes. Fuel condition in high idle. All right, on my way. Here we go. All right, so we're looking for 95 knots. Yeah, I forgot to uh, contact the tower. I'm also, you know, I'm also quite a bit more distracted trying to explain every everything, verbalize everything I'm thinking, um, and read the chat, respond to the chat. Yes, Hound Dog, it's true. In an ideal world, uh, I think I wouldn't be talking to chat while if I'm trying to take this very seriously, but it is a simulator. And uh, it's as serious as you want to take it, so. Clearance. Uh, it automatically gives you the clearance uh, when you when you go in on the runway, so we're good here. All right, I'm catching up to you guys. Pulling my throttle back a little bit. All right, acknowledge handoff to Boston Center. All right, and I'm going to hit my autopilot on. And flaps up now that we're at a safe altitude. Go to Boston Center and contact them. Okay, we have a manual sequence here, so I can't use. Um... All right, two nine four nine. Good on the altimeter. Continue as planned. Okay, so um, let me check my flight plan really quickly. All right, so what we're going to do, because so there's a manual sequence here as part of that departure procedure to turn us to the south. But because the departure procedure doesn't make any sense for our flight plan, um, we're not going to fly that. So what we're going to do is instead override this and we're going to go directly over to our first on route waypoint. We're going to skip the Albany VOR. That's 108 miles south of us. That makes no sense. So what we're going to do is go directly to... Yankee Juliet November YJN and you can see that that's going to be just a north turn from the heading we're already heading at from the runway heading 
So here, YJN, if we want to go to this, we can do two things. We can either activate a direct route to it. So meaning from our current position, right where our plane is now, directly to that, um, to that waypoint. Or the other thing we can do is activate a specific leg of the flight plan. So each one of these white lines, each one of these segments is a leg from one waypoint to another. So in this case, from here going south, that's one leg. And then here, this line going from the VOR down here all the way up to this VOR from ALB to YJN, that's another leg. So if we activated a direct two right now, that would draw a line from us to this waypoint just like that, directly to it. If we activate the leg that goes to YJN, that'll activate this white line right here. So just for this exercise, I'm gonna do that. So we're not gonna go all the way south here, that'll take forever. I'm instead going to activate this leg of the flight plan. So we're still gonna be on the original route, we're just gonna skip across to this white line, basically. So to do that, we activate YJN. So what I'm going to do is turn on the cursor. So you click the FMS knob and then move down to YJN. And then instead of hitting direct to, that would draw a line from us to YJN. We're going to hit menu and then use activate leg. And that's going to activate the leg that goes to YJN. So this white line here to the west. So I'm going to hit enter for activate leg, then hit enter again to confirm. And now you can see the white line is magenta. So now we're going to fly to that existing line as if, you know, we're basically just taking a shortcut, but keeping our same flight plan um, instead of doing direct to. So we're still going to be on the planned leg. We're just uh, cutting across to it like that. So that's the difference between direct to and activating a leg. Activating a leg just takes one of the existing legs that are routed out and activates it. Whereas direct to goes from your current location to the waypoint you selected. That's good to know. Thanks, thanks Josh, for letting me know about that because I didn't know that you could retry IFR after requesting flight following. Because uh, in you know that seems kind of backwards, right? You wouldn't contact them, request flight following and advisories, and then contact them again and request an IFR clearance. You would just contact them and request an IFR clearance. Um, anyway, so we are going towards our intended route already. So that activated leg for our course. So we're already on the right path to get over there. And we're in heading mode at runway heading. So we're just going that direction towards that leg. Now what we can do is turn on nav mode to arm it in advance. So here we'll have GPS in white Heading mode is active, GPS mode is armed, meaning nav mode is armed. So once we get closer to the broken line here, closer to our course, it'll automatically activate GPS mode. And that's an NXI thing. So we have to do that to get to, um, to our desired course. We have to manually fly to it either with heading mode or just fly it by hand to get near that course before it'll activate. I know this is not as scenic as uh, the other flights we did in group flights, but you know, whatever. We're doing something a little bit different. I have Exelord Nine Niner behind me, Aviator. You're catching up. That's cool. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna keep my. Actually, there are a couple of guys still behind me and a, and a couple of guys ahead, so I'm just gonna leave my power where it's at. Um, if you want to nerd out on like at the POH for the Grand Caravan. Um, I know some people, there are some settings, I think I heard people say things like um, set both the torque and the prop to 1900. I've seen other people say set it to 1800 or 1700. Um, the weather is amazing. Moderate precipitation the whole way. Oh, and let me, uh, I'm going to hit control four and I'm going to hunt around here. So this is another advantage of the lock mode is... I can see where these controls are when I'm blindly hunting around without the flashlight and turn them on. So it makes it a little easier. You guys know I'm a big fan of the lock, the lock mode controls. I know a lot of people switch back to legacy, but I, I think it's got its uses. Moderate precip all the way. This is awesome. 
And uh, I can turn on the next rat again. Oh yeah, nice. This is gonna be less crazy than it was before. It looks like, I'm not sure which direction the storm, like this, uh, the precipitation's heading. It looks like it might be going to the east. So we might be in this moderate area and then we're gonna turn up to the northwest towards Montreal. We may dodge this severe cloud a bit. You know, realistically, we would dodge it intentionally. Um, but you know, this is already pre pre-programmed and you know, we're just flying together for fun here, so. I wonder why everyone had their my name in the upper left corner of their maps. Oh, nor <laughs> north up. <laughs> you can uh you can remove your name from the upper left of the map, David, if you want. <laughs> you can go to the menu setting here and instead of choosing your last name, you can choose track up instead of north up. There you go. Now you can you can switch to a different last name if you want. Uh, yeah, if you want track up, you can do that. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> all right, so here we are. Uh, all right, 35, we're 35 miles away from our waypoint, but again, we're going to intercept this course over here. So yeah, just keep, I'm just staying on that runway heading of 325. Heading up, yeah, heading up, track up, north up. And then, yeah, it looks like that the, the severe area here, this area of the cell is moving to the east. So it looks like we'll we'll be in moderate to mild precip once we get closer to the airport. Strange that you could see me as I can't see anybody or you. Uh, sorry, TriMet, I'm just reading this out. Maybe related to the active live traffic. Could be, yeah, I, I'm seeing a bunch of people. I see, who do we see? MJDYSO. I see Flouchy. Whatever, 815. I see you, Trimon, in front of me in the SR-22. And then there's a bunch of people behind. Oh, Cerebral, the Cerebral uh, pair, sorry, is right next to me, right underneath me. And yeah, I see Aviator, and I see a bunch of you guys behind me, too. Arash, if you guys keep your... Uh, okay, we're, we're making a right-hand turn on the course here. All right, let's go watch this. All right, so now GPS mode should activate and we should be turning on to this leg right here. And then, um, so we're on this leg to YJN. So this leg is drawn between the Albany VOR and YJN right here. I'm just looking up some of the weather at Montreal right now. So the weather, oh, it says VFR now. We'll see how the live weather in the sim changes. It might have, uh, it might, it says VFR right now. So, uh, but it, it's reporting. Okay, this might be marginal though. It's reporting scattered clouds. Okay, it's scattered clouds at 2000 feet. Yeah, so it's VFR just because that first cloud layer is so high up. So it sounds like we might just be doing a nighttime landing and not necessarily a low visibility landing here. All right, negative two degrees. So I'm gonna turn on our anti-ice system right here. So if you guys are getting any icing, it looks like it's like a little frosty on the, on the strut right here under the wing. Um, if you hit control one, to get to this area, there's a wing light you can turn on or off. And then if you look out the left, that'll light up the wing. Um, you might have to kind of have to move around a bit to get a good view of it. Yeah, and it looks like we're getting a little bit of icing. And you can also see it right here on the strut a little bit. So then you can turn on the anti-ice right here with the fluid control section of anti-ice. So you should have the pedo heat over here turned on the left one. This stall heat one uh, is in op. And then over here you have the windshield control 
and then you have the primary uh, anti-ice system. So you can turn that to the middle or to the high. I'll just turn it all the way up to high. But our airspeed is looking good, so I don't think it's too bad. Negative two degrees, though. And we're going at 150 knots right now. I think, if I recall correctly, the POH says that in um, generally, it, unless it's cool, unless it's very calm air, you want to be under 150 knots in the Grand Caravan. All right, so we are only 24 miles from YJN, and then we're going to make our left-hand turn towards Montreal. If I go and take a look back at Navigraph, I'm going to pull up the Montreal charts. This is CYMX, so if you have Navigraph or uh, you want to use ChartFox or ForeFlight or a little nav map or whatever tool you're using, or you can just look on with the ones I'm pulling up here. But yeah, we have an ILS at three different runways here. We have uh, 06, we have 11, and we have 24 for the ILS. And then up here, we can see the ATIS 1257. That frequency is also on the chart. So actually, what we can do is try to dial in 1257 in our COM2 radio, see if we can pick it up early and see if we can figure out which runway is active. So we'll kind of know which uh, approach to expect, or at least which runway to expect. Whether it's the ILS or the RNAV approach, we'll find out. Um, so we can do that on the COM2 radio. So over here, this is the uh, COM knob right here. If we push this center one in, it'll move the cursor to the bottom, so to COM2. Then we can dial in 125.7. Hopefully that's correct. We'll turn in 125.7 and then activate it with a little swap button right here. Oh, spoiler alert, it's 2-4. And then now that that's activated, we can listen uh, to COM2 simultaneously just by hitting the COM2 button on the audio panel right over here. And if we hear something, then it's in range. It is. So it said 263 at 14. Temperature 10, 2.10, altimeter 2942, 2942, ILS 24, and landing and departing 24. All right, so we have information Charlie. So I can. Just leave it tuned into that ATIS and just turn COM2 off just by, by muting COM2 right here. So we're just not listening to it. Um, earlier in the week, somebody on one of the YouTube videos asked about why, why would you use COM2? Like, what's it for? Um, you know, besides redundancy, this is one use case. Is, you know, how I look at it is I like to use COM1 for my two way communication. So uh, realistically, I would have the standby set up. To my next frequency already so in this case it would be the next it would be either like an approach controller or it would be the tower and i'd have that in my standby and that i would use com one for my one way or two-way communication all right so they have us turning to montreal center so we're going to acknowledge and you know it's doing that automatically for us when we acknowledge them here so i can hit tune montreal center but if you want to take it more seriously and you're not using VATSIM, you could just not use the ATC window. You could take that mental note or write it down when it comes up, when there are instructions. And then in this case, you would go and manually change to 132.85. So here you could dial that in. And then you could swap it right here. And now to contact them, number one on the keyboard will do it. It's usually ATC response one. As you can see, if I open it, it's ATC response number one. So even without opening it, once I tune in and I swap it, I can just hit one on my keyboard and we're contacting them. Give them our altitude. They'll give us an altimeter probably. So two nine or four six, because our autopilot is holding our altitude, I'm gonna turn it one at a time, like turn it slowly because the autopilot's gonna react to that change. Since changing the altimeter setting changes our altimeter, what altitude we're at. So it sounds like, yeah, ILS 24 is what's active. 
So what we could do already, because we're expecting ILS 2.4, I can go to the procedure menu and load that without activating it. So, and this is something we could do at our departure airport. If we looked up the weather, got the ATIS, or got the active runway in some way for the, our arrival airport, we could either guess based off the winds, if we just had a METAR for the airport. So in this case, the winds were like, I think it said 260 at 12, or I don't know what it was, something like that. The real world METAR right now shows 250 at five. So when we go into our approaches, 24 is a logical runway to assume that we would be landing at. If the wind is five knots at 250, then there's a good chance that ILS 24 or runway 24 is in use. So whether it's the ILS or the RNAV, which happens to be an LPV or an NGB approach, probably not as likely, or a visual approach, uh, you know, we could guess at runway 24, make our best guess. Anyway, because we got the ATIS now and we know that runway 24 is active, we're going to load that in. Now, we don't know what our transition waypoint is, though, right? So they just tell us what the active runway is. So we have these two possible transition waypoints, as well as vectors. Vectors is if ATC is just going to be vectoring us onto our final approach course, they'll be giving us headings. Uh, that doesn't happen with, with um, Microsoft ATC. Um, so here we're going to have to pick between Vetno and ZMX. So I'm just going to guess if I come in here and I look at the approach, bring up the ILS for 2-4. So ZMX is right on the approach path here, the final approach course. So if we fly to ZMX, we're probably going to get a procedure turn as part of it. And then there's Vetno, which is up here. This is an initial fix up to the northeast. But we're coming from the southeast. If we were coming from the north up this direction, it would be more likely that we would cross over Vetno for our, our initial approach fix and then continue straight on like this. But because we're coming from this direction, um, it's kind of hard to say. Like, we're going to be here. We're going to turn to the left, but we could turn north and come in this direction. Or we could go over the airport like this and then fly outbound and fly a procedure turn. Um, so I don't think it's too easy to guess in this case. Because we're coming from the bottom right, we could go more north to Vetno. Uh, actually, no, we wouldn't do that, right? Because that left-hand turn is insane. We would never make a left-hand turn of, like, what is that? Um, that that's a, a lot to turn, a, a very sharp left-hand turn, a lot of turning to do to the left. So I'm going to pick ZMX. That's probably the one we're going to get. And as part of that, we're going to have to fly outbound. We're going to have to do our procedure turn here and then fly back in. Uh, minimums here, if we look down at the bottom left, they're right here. Our decision altitude, 439. So we round up to 440. So once again, I'm going to put in 440 here. And then you see primary frequency, 111.7. We scroll up here, localizer 111.7, and there's the identifier code is IIT. Come back here, that matches 111.7, so that's correct with the database. And now because we are not flying directly to ZMX yet, we're not going to use activate. If we use activate, that's going to make the initial approach fix our active waypoint. We don't want to do that yet because they haven't told us to. So in this case, we're just going to load it. And it gives us a warning that uh, during the approach, we're using radio, we're using the ILS for our guidance, not GPS. So it's just for monitoring. So it's giving us a warning. All right, so now that that's in there, we can see all of our waypoints there for our approach. And if we want, we can zoom in and pan, or we can do the highlighting here to review the route. So as you point at each one, it'll auto zoom the map for us. So here we can see we're going to come in this direction, make a right-hand turn, go to this waypoint ZMX. Then we're going to go up here and do our procedure turn to do our reversal and then come back in just like we did on the other one. All right, here comes the uh, approach assignment, so we'll see. Yep, we got it. 2-4, Zulu Mike X-Ray. Cleared to Zulu Mike X-Ray. Acknowledge the assigned approach. Okay, and now they cleared us to go direct 
cleared us to Zulu Mike X-ray. So right now our active waypoint is not Zulu Mike X-ray, it is the airport itself. So remember, I didn't activate it before, so I have, to, I have to activate it now. And so I can do that just by going here and highlighting this. Or what I can do is go up to Procedure and activate the approach. So in both of the cases, it's going to make a direct to the ZMX waypoint. So I'll hit Enter. Now you can see it's automatically changed to direct to ZMX. So there's this, you can do the same thing in multiple ways. We could do direct to by highlighting it and hitting the direct to button down here, or we could use activate approach, which does the same thing. And that activate approach here is the same thing we saw when we were selecting the approach. So where we had the choice between load or activate, if we chose activate, it would have also done this. It makes your initial approach fix the active waypoint. And because we had autopilot turned on, it's already turned us towards ZMX and it's flying a direct route to ZMX from our current location. All right, hopefully everybody made that turn. Looks like everybody's still on it. Sweet, I see your lights. <laughs> X-Lord and uh, Subdued Rat are right close to me. I can see their lights. Oh, I see Aviator's lights too. Looks like uh, Subdued Rat is teleporting a little bit to us. Yeah, if you guys do want to catch up, if you are a little bit behind, you can use the sim acceleration. Um, you can bind those hotkeys called sim rate increase and sim rate decrease and use those hotkeys to uh, warp speed to catch up. All right, so now let's review our altitude. So if we look here again in our flight plan, we have 3,000 feet. Remember, we're all the way up at 8,000 feet. We've been holding that since our takeoff. That was our initial instruction. So we need to get down to 3,000 feet for the initial approach fix. And then here, the procedure turn, we're maintaining 3,000 feet. After the procedure turn, we need to go down to 1590. So for our final altitude for VNAV, it's going to be 1590. So I'm going to set our selected altitude down to below that. So I hit Control-2 for this view. You can see 8,000 over here in blue. And we're going to turn that all the way down to be below 1590. So we can't do 1590, but we can do 1500. So we just want to make sure it's below so it can take us down and hold 1590 specifically. Um, and what we have here is our top of descent. And down here on the flight plan, you can see it's six minutes to the top of descent. So it's going to descend our flight path angle right here, standard of three degree flight path um, angle for the descent. That gives us a target of 774 feet per minute. And then right here, uh, ZMX, that's our the waypoint we're headed to. So that means in six minutes, VNAV will bring us down to 3000. But remember, we have to arm VNAV, so control two again. Remember, we're in altitude hold mode right now. Over here, you can just see altitude 8000 feet. It won't do anything other than keep us there until we tell it. So up here, I'm gonna click the VNAV button. You can see it right here, VNAV. Push that, see the light turn on. Remember, you have to change selected altitude first. If it doesn't turn on, it's because you have to dial in your target altitude first. In our case, it's letting it go all the way down to the final approach fix altitude. Um, so now that we've hit VNAV, you see VPATH here is armed, which means it's on standby. So VPATH right here, it's waiting for us to get to our top of descent. So once we get here to top of descent in five minutes, it's going to take us down to 3000. And then it's going to automatically take us all the way down here. I am going to keep an eye out for VNAV during the procedure turn, though, um, because of how the GPS like suspends. Potentially, it'll suspend during a hold, um, not necessarily during a procedure turn. But anyway, I'm just going to keep an eye on it because there is a chance we'll need to hit the VNAV button a second time to rearm it after the procedure turn. So that's something to keep an eye out for. I think this rule only applies to holds in lieu of procedure turns. This is marked as a procedure turn, meaning we just do the turn and we come in. We, we have no expectation of doing circuits and holding there. Um, it's just a reversal to get us onto the course. But for some of them, the ones that are actual holds or holds in lieu of a procedure turn, those we could potentially just go around the racetrack over and over. And because of that, um, I have to look up the specifics, but there, there is a circumstance I ran into where I had to rearm VNAV again after I was finished 
uh, making that hold in lieu of a procedure turn turn. Um, anyway, what we're going to do is once we finish the procedure turn, that just means we're going to look at our autopilot status and make sure that V path is still armed. Because after the procedure turn here, you can see we need to go down to 1590. The previous, um, the previous flight we did, that approach, we only had to drop about 200 feet or so after the procedure turn. And actually the glide slope was captured before then. So we really didn't need VNAV to go down those 200 feet. In this case though, we have to drop uh, 1400 feet after the procedure turn before we get to the final approach fix. So that's why I wanna keep an eye on V path and make sure that's on so we don't miss that. So uh, if you're flying along, this is what you're, if you're, and you're using autopilot, it should be, should look like this right now. You should have 1500 feet if you're doing the ILS. So we're doing the ILS for runway 24. So we have GPS mode on because it's following our flight path. Autopilot's obviously on, holding us at 8,000 right now. V pass should be in white because it's on standby, ready to take us down to 3,000 feet for the first descent. And then for selected altitude, you want this to be either 3,000 or below. I like to put in the final altitude so I don't have to wait and change it again and then rearm VNAV. So it's up to you um, what you want to do. And yeah, if you're if you're using something like um, if you're if you're like a VATSIM person, like. ATC when they give you the instructions and you know even in Microsoft they give us the instructions to descend they'll say descend and maintain this altitude you know and they expect you to start your descent right away um, but in this case because we can't manually um, start our VNAV descent or anything like that we have to wait for the top of descent there's no way to edit our altitudes here or uh, start our descent early with VNAV I'm just going to wait even if they tell us to descend uh, realistically we would listen and start our descent but what I'm going to do is wait for this so we can take advantage of VNAV. Uh, Mechine says, probably in real life you would get vectors to catch the localizer directly at ZMX. That's that's my understanding. Yeah, I, I also don't fly. You guys know I don't fly in real life. I also don't fly on Vatsim very much or at all. I, I flew Pilot Edge last year. Um, but yeah. The most common, as far as I know, is yeah, that you would get vectors to intercept the ILS, to intercept the localizer. So, you know, at this point or over here, they would vector you north, they would vector you northeast, they'd vector you around this direction, or, you know, it'd probably look more like up this way and then to the left and then this way. Yeah, to, um, to intercept the localizer. So if that is the case, you would just, you know, if you're using VATSIM and you're getting vectored by ATC, you would just sync your heading bug straight ahead, and then you would switch to heading mode, and then you would just dial in their heading instructions, as well as um, altitudes. So you would use vertical speed mode, and you would use heading mode to follow their instructions for, uh, for heading, and for your course, and for your um, altitude. Weather is okay-ish. Clear of clouds at 850. Moderate precipitation. All right, we got our own. Uh, we got our own like uh, advanced ATIS in chat. Thanks VFR. <laughs> yeah. So remember, because we put ATIS for our destination and on COM2, whenever we want, we can just turn on COM2 radio right here and get updated information. It's still on Charlie. So I can turn it off because we know that the last code we got for the ATIS was code Charlie that's updated every hour and then the number moves on or the letter moves on. So if it was Delta, you know, after Charlie comes Delta, if it was Delta and we heard that at the beginning of the recording, we would know that there's updated weather to pick up and we would note all the new weather information. Um, but we have Charlie, so we have the current information still. And looks like we do still have crazy winds here. You can just see how much more stable the caravan is, though, uh, than flying the 172. This thing is uh, handling the winds no problem. We were just getting tossed around like crazy in the 172.
Let's see if I can. 800 feet. 2944 on the altimeter. Trying to take a look at X Lord's plane over here. Oh, he's got the he's got the green livery going. I love how it always shows pink on the inside on the avionics. All right, let's acknowledge that. So he said we're uh, we're 800 feet below. So there was a big change in the altimeter. It sounds like two nine or four four. Oh no no no! Oh, sorry, we're good. All right, I am gonna update the altimeter, but we're gonna ignore this um, just because our options with VNAV are limited right now. So I'm gonna acknowledge this. Otherwise, they're gonna cancel the IFR clearance. Um, they want us to climb and maintain 8,000, but our VNAV profile, I really want to use VNAV. Realistically, we would listen to ATC, obviously, um, but in this case, I want to take advantage of what we can do with VNAV, so I'm just letting us do the descent. Um, so I'm already down to 6,300. We're about to pass 6,200 feet. Um, in the future, um, we'll, we'll have like more VNAV capabilities, so we can... Um, put our descent in earlier, like um, change the flight path angle um, and change the altitudes if we want to, you know, we, we want, I don't think you can change the altitudes of the procedure altitudes, but the on route altitudes, we would be able to change them um, to be able to just have more flexibility with VNAV. But in this case, like, um, yeah, I just want to use VNAV, so I'm just letting it take us down. He's just going to keep yelling at us until we get a little closer to the airport. And check our PFD options here. I mean, we would normally listen to them, of course, just because of obstacles and stuff like that. Um, it doesn't look like we have any crazy terrain happening, so... It is a risk to do something like this. We wouldn't actually do this, but... Um, yeah, I want to see VPath and VNAV in, in action, so that's why we're doing this. Uh, and then I'm just turning off Nexrad over here on my inset map. I usually like to check the Nexrad and turn it on and off here and there on the large map. And then I like to have... Um, I personally use the relative terrain mode over here on the left because I want it to act like a, like a ground warning, basically. All right, I'm going to close the flight plan and I'm going to turn off Nexrad over here just to clean up the map and then zoom in so we can see more. You can also see over here this thin line. This represents our missed approach procedure. So you can see it's got our entry and then it's got our racetrack. I guess it's it, it almost it looks like it's left hand turns for this hold. Um, but that's where the missed approach procedure is depicted on the map and you can also see it in the instructions. Um, down here if you look past the missed approach point. So here's our missed approach point. And then uh, our, this is kind of an advisory altitude. Before making our first turn, we should climb to 3,000 feet. And then we have our missed approach holding point at Yankee Uniform Lima. So this VOR over here. And it's got the hold instructions already entered in for us. So it looks like, yeah, it looks like uh, it's just from the image here. It looks like it's left hand turns in the hold um, And then it has the radial it has the in and outbound course put in um, And when you define your own hold if you ever do that you can do that by Choosing the waypoint and then hitting menu and then you can choose hold at waypoint And this is where you can define the hold this one is in there automatically as part of the missed approach procedure for us but this is where you can choose your inner outbound course, and then you can choose the leg, whether it's timed or a distance-based leg for the hold, and then you can choose the turn direction as well. Standard turns are right for holds, uh, but it looks like in this in this case it looks like it might be turns to the left. Okay, so here. All right, so there's the descent and maintain three thousand feet. So, um, ATC would have us descend at 3,000 feet starting right here, which is kind of crazy because we would have to descend from 8,000 to 3,000 feet from here to here, which is it's probably only a couple miles. Uh, I'm going to hit one to reply to them. 
And I'm pulling back on my throttle. We're going we're going pretty fast. I'm just pulling back a little mainly because of the wind. Uh, not because we're going to hit a speed limit or anything in the Grand Caravan. So I'm just pulling back to about 150 knots. All right, altitude is holding at 3,000. So we're already down at 3,000 feet. And we're going to go outbound, make our left hand turn here to start the procedure turn, then turn right. And then once we turn around right, we're going to line up with the localizer course, which here on the chart, our course is 240. So we can see that up here in the top. It says final approach course, final approach course 240. And then it's depicted on the map right here after the procedure turn. So you can see the procedure turn is to the north side of the course, of the final approach course. And you can see our little pink triangle here showing where we are. Um, so yeah, on our way, when we turn back in, we'll line up with the localizer course. And then you can see we're gonna go down and hold 3000 feet until we intercept the glide slope. And it says we'll do that about 4.5 nautical miles out uh, at 3000 feet. And then, yeah, it's an ILS, so we can go down to 439, call it 440 for our decision our decision altitude, decision height. AGL is 200 feet from the ground. And then we also see our missed approach instructions here. So climb to 3000 on track 240, left turn direct to the YUL VOR. So that's down here is the Montreal VOR. You can see that right here and right here. And this dashed line here depicts on the map view our missed approach procedure. So you can see we're climbing runway heading on a track of 240, left hand turn over to YUL and we'll hold at YUL at uh, 3000 feet. And those are also, um, so we're starting our procedure turn right now. I'm gonna add in a little bit more of that throttle. So we're at 200 or 120 knots. We can go a little bit faster. Um, and then down here, there's a shorthand for all those missed approach procedure um, instructions. And those are these boxes right here. So this right here, climb, this is straight ahead to 3000. And then right there's the uh, 240. So that's just the direction we're on, which we're pretty much going to be just flying, keeping our runway heading synced um, because our final approach course is 240. So that's just saying to stay on that same course or track of 240. And then there, left hand turn is what we're going to make to YULVOR, and it gives us the frequency of it right there again, 116.3, if we did the missed approach and the hold. And then down here, we can see the runway lighting system. So we'll have that familiar rabbit leading up to the threshold of the runway. So we'll have those lights available. It sounds like the clouds are not as bad as our last one. Um, let's check the ATIS one more time. It's going to turn on COM2, see if we have information Charlie. We do. 26488, so that's favorable for our runway, of course. 600 feet broken. 9 degrees Celsius. 2943. ILS 24 is still in use. All right, so we still have Charlie, but we reviewed um, the wind is favorable. It's gonna be a little bit to the left, um, only eight knots. And yeah, it said we had broken clouds at 600. So our minimums, remember our, remember the cloud reports are AGL and our minimum decision height here in AGL is 200. So our minimum's 200. AGL and the clouds are 600, so we have a buffer. We should be out of the clouds around 400 feet above our decision altitude. All right, so now that we're making our turn here and we're going to be heading towards the final approach fix, this is when I like to turn on approach mode. You can turn it on earlier than that if you want, but really you just need approach mode on the autopilot to be turned on before you hit the glide slope. Um, in this case, and in general, that is when you hit the final approach fix. But in Microsoft Flight Simulator, a lot of the time, you do get the glide slope and glide path before the final approach fix. Um, so, as, you know, in general, once I'm on a rough course, like I'm basically on course with the runway, my final approach course is usually when I turn it on. Okay, and remember, we are flying the ILS, so we do need to switch over to use 
the localizer frequency, 111.7. And over here, you can see that was already tuned in for us. So it's on nav one and it's on nav two. And our landing lights are still on, strobe and beacon and all that's on. And there is a landing uh, notch of flaps. I don't think I'm gonna use the landing notch. I'll probably just use the first notch of flaps because we have like eight knots of, we have an eight knot wind. Um, I haven't looked up the POH for the landing uh, procedure for like whether you, just in terms of if you want full flaps or not, mattering the wind. I'll probably just use one notch of flaps. All right, so we have our glide slope now and automatically it turned it uh, turned our navigation source to our localizer. If it doesn't do that automatically, remember you have the CDI button down here to change from your GPS source to your localizer one and two. Or, you know, if you're using a VOR approach, it would be VOR one or two, et cetera, whatever um, radio-based navigation aid you're using. All right, so I'm gonna start slowing us down. We are still four miles from the final approach fix. And you can see that our flap range here for full flaps, this white, uh, notch right here starts at 125. Actually, if we look down here, I'm going to double check on our flap settings. Um, yeah, the takeoff is 150 right here, it says. For the first notch of flaps, we can use them at 150 or below indicated airspeed. And then down here, 125 for our landing flaps. Uh, Mekin says, yeah, full flaps is for short takeoff and landing. Okay, cool. We'll just use one extremely slow. Got it, yeah, I'll use, I'll just use one notch then. And um, because we had autopilot turned on and we had approach mode armed, the glide slope has been captured automatically. So now we're on the glide slope and we're at 2.6 miles from the final approach fix. After we hit the final approach fix here, we have four nautical miles to our missed approach point, which is the threshold runway two four. I'm going to sync our heading bug to straight ahead. All right, we're, we are inbound. We're going to contact tower. So again, if you want to do this manually, 119 or 1, you would go over here. And I'm using COM1, 119.1. I'm just using my mouse wheel to roll the buttons. And you know, if you do VATSIM or something, you have to do it this way. And then you hit the swap button. And now for this ATC, I can press 1 on my keyboard to contact the flight sim ATC. Oops, Tower hit it again. No there we go. To one kilo India Papa, eight miles northeast inbound ILS runway two four approach. All right, so this, uh, if, if the weather is correct at 600 AGL, we should be out of the clouds with about 400 feet to spare. Real life METAR right now says broken at 500 feet. All right, so acknowledge they said wind is 264 at eight, clear for the ILS runway two four. 29 or 43 is set. The altimeter doesn't um, doesn't affect our glide slope, um, but it does affect our missed approach if we have to do that. All right, so I'm slowing down here. I can see the runway lights right there. Looks like a couple of you are landing already, putting my one notch of flaps out. And we're at 3.4 miles. Two six four at eight. Clear to land two four. So hit one to acknowledge the clear to land. Clear to land two four. We're on two four three here, on our heading, our course two three nine, and our altitude we can go down to is four hundred and forty feet. Just gonna double check that. Seems really low. Yeah, two hundred four hundred and forty feet. Uh, yeah, we can clearly see the lighting system already. So we're not gonna go missed. We're at eleven hundred feet. And they told us the altimeter, um, they just gave us one. I think we're good. Uh, so we're at a thousand feet right now. We can go all the way down to 440 feet before having a, the runway environment visible. All right. And I'm going to bring my, I got to slow down quite a bit here. This is, seems like a pretty, uh, it could just be like my brain playing tricks on me. What is the descent here? Oh, no, it is three degrees. It is three degrees. It seemed a little more steep to me for a minute. All right, so I'm at 80 knots. I'm going to slow down to 
75 knots or so. We have one notch of flaps out. We are at 780. And if we look at the wind, you can see it's straight ahead. It's a pushing a little bit to the left. We just got the call for 500 AGL. So remember, when we hear 500 AGL, we know we have down to 200 AGL for this approach. So we still have 300 feet to go because the ILS it goes down to 200 on this approach. 440, we're at 640, 200 feet to go, 72 knots. I'm adding just a little bit of power here. One notch of flaps are down. Could turn autopilot off right now. We could wait until we get to our minimums. We're at 440, we're at 540 right now, 100 feet to go on minimums. I'm just gonna disconnect now. And remember, uh, I'm gonna keep in mind that the wind's gonna push us a little bit to the left. Um, I'm keeping an eye on my flight path marker right down here um, to try to get that onto the runway. There we go. Happy lights are still good. Speed is good. 76. Getting ready to go to idle when I cross over the threshold here. All right, I compensated a little too much to the right there. I, uh, as you guys know, I I have a challenge um, compensating for the wind. Usually, it'll it'll be lined up pretty well, and then I'll kind of mess it up one way or another. Um, so I definitely overcompensated a little bit there. I'm gonna clear the runway because there's probably a, probably at least one other person landing. I see end game. I pause to see all of you land. <laughs> Oh, nice. I want to go to the drone. I think uh, one more person's coming in. Some dude rat and X Lord just got in. Looks like Aviator just landed. He's still rolling down the taxiway. If I was a little uh, closer ahead. Look at all these caravans. Um, let me respond here. Ground handoff. All right, so I'm just going to switch our fuel condition down here back to from high idle to low idle for taxiing. And then I'm going to switch on our taxi lights and turn off our landing lights, even though we're still technically not off the runway. I haven't really cleared it yet. What happens in the NXI if you do not disconnect the autopilot? Well, it's not going to be reliable. It's not um, like following an ILS like that is not in this kind of plane. It's not going to give you like an auto landing system. Um, but you know, you in the sim, you could try it out. Like you should, you should be disconnecting the autopilot when you're at, at or above the minimums. Um, and there's hand flying it because technically you should have a visual of the runway environment and be able to land visually at that point. Um, there are some planes that have like a full on auto land system though. Like um, I know some of the airliners have it. I think the implement the implementations vary, mattering which airliner you're flying. Um, but you know, if you just want to have some fun and test it, you can try to take it down. I think in one of my really early videos, like more than a year ago, uh, when I was first learning ILS stuff, I was trying to uh, fly it down um, as low as it could go, and I would just like disconnect and flare. Um, it's kind of a your mileage may vary kind of situation, you know. It'd be fun to try it out, but yeah. Oh, Cat 3, yeah. And I haven't flown any of the Cat 2 or Cat 3 ILS approaches. Uh, but yeah, I know Cat 2 brings you down to like 100 feet AGL, and I, I assume Cat 3 is, what is it, like 50 feet or 40 feet? or I, I don't even know. I would be guessing. Sweet, that was pretty fun. Um, all right, so that was two successful landing. Wow, I've been on for three hours. It doesn't feel like three hours. Uh, let's go ahead and get our taxi instructions here. So I'm going to tune into ground, get taxi to parking because I want to get credit for the flight. I love all the car all the caravans are sweet. Oh, I see. Tr oh, tr is Trimon landing right now? I think Trimon's landing right now in his SR22. Oh, I want to get over there faster. Drone speed. Kilo, 
Oh yeah, he's come. It looks like he's. Uh. Oh, is he stopped already? Oh no, it looks like he's coming in. I can't really tell. Hold on, I got to acknowledge taxi instructions. All right, there we go. Back to the drone. I'm gonna try to try to fly out here and do some spectating. Oh yeah, he he got assigned the uh, opposite direction. Oh, Cat Three is auto land forty feet. That is so cool. I'm just gonna go wait over here at the touchdown markers. We do have time to see a landing. Yeah, I think. Uh, oh yeah, Tri Trimon said earlier in the in the chat he was assigned ILS zero six, so it uh, it took him around the other side. He got the other side of the runway, which is pretty funny, just because. Yeah, they wouldn't have the ILS active on both sides at a time, right? <laughs> Are there even runways that have an actual ILS on both ends? Or do they do back course? Because they, they would have to have a glide slope and a localizer on both ends of the runway for each direction, correct? No pressure, dude. You got it. The SR-22, I, I have a challenging time landing it just because it's so much faster. Um, and my partner, she's flown, she's doing her instrument training and she, she started with the Cherokees and, um, and the Archer specifically. And then she flies an SR-20 sometimes in the, just the speeds, everything is just faster. You know, they're going, all the speeds are like 10, 20 knots faster. Um, so everything just comes at you faster. He's down. You can join us at the far end of the runway. <laughs> oh, we're just at the next taxi, but we're not too far off. Awesome. That was it was fun doing night flights. I, I think like yeah, I like the scenic stuff, but I also like doing these kind of uh these kind of landing challenges in a way. This one was much easier than the first one, but I'm glad we got one in that was uh a really sketchy landing, because it's just exciting. <laughs> Gonna let this emerald air here in front of us. Oh, you're X Lord. I'll try it out at Cat 3. Most of the international airports have one ILS for each runway. So two ILS, one in each direction. I think uh, I remember a while back someone was doing um, in flight sim. I think they were trying to do a specific approach and they were really confused because the ILS wasn't working correctly. And I think basically what happened was it was an airport where one ILS, oh, what was it? Basically there, there was an ILS on both sides of the runway, like uh, you're describing Mechin or Mechine. And, um, and, but the flight sim, flight sim didn't um, ever activate one of them. Like only one of them was ever active. I think is what uh, what this person was running into. I, I can hardly remember this. I can't remember the specifics because I think it was like, you know, six months plus ago. Um, but there was a situation with that where it was like we were trying to figure out why it wasn't working. And it just turned out that the ILS on the opposite side of the of that the for the opposite side of the runway was the one that was active and the other one was never active. So they were getting um, the, they were getting the localizer as if they were doing like a back course approach, but they would never get the glide slope or something like that until they went to the other direction, even though it was assigning them the ILS for the one they were attempting. So I actually uh, I did buy the track IR. I know we talked about this in the last stream. I bought track IR and it's sitting on my desk. I used it for like 10 or 15 minutes and then put it away again. <laughs> um, I did 
some people gave some tips on using it. They said to like increase the activation zone or something. So you have to turn your head significantly before it turns on. And I can understand doing that just to be able to look around like when you're coming in on your base and final turns. Uh, that sounds pretty useful. So I'm going to give that a shot uh, for the next one. And um, yeah, I'll see if I like it. I'm trying to I'm trying to give it more than like a few days to see if I get used to it. Um, and I did end up uh, reformatting my whole computer. I upgraded my processor to a 5900. Um, and actually, I noticed a pretty significant increase in my frame rate. Um, I'm getting like a good... It matters the area, but I was flying kind of in the middle of nowhere on ultra settings and getting in the 70s. Um, I think before I was getting under 60 most of the time. I didn't change my video card. I'm still on a 3080. But that processor uh, upgrade did a lot. Um, I went from a 16 core processor to the 12 core 5900 processor, which is kind of like the go to gaming processor right now, I think. And they were in stock, so I picked one of those up and I rebuilt. I got a new motherboard as well with more USB ports, um, which is nice so I don't have to use as many hubs. But if you guys are struggling with frame rates, um, you know, a processor upgrade might help you. It seems to do a lot for Microsoft Flight Sim because it's pretty CPU heavy as well. Um, and I'm running on Windows 11 as well, and I haven't had any issues. Um, even doing the streaming, doing the stream today has been working just fine. Uh, using the like Adobe programs I use, like Premiere seems okay. <laughs> no, not only a 3080, <laughs> Warren. I, I recognize I got really lucky last year when I got my hands on one. I was running a 2060 Super um, last year and I got really lucky. I got on Best Buy and got it. Um, so I was really lucky. I totally recognize that. And I know it's impossible to get your hands on a 3080. Um, it has been for since the pandemic started. It's been really hard. So yeah, I totally recognize that, dude. Um, I got extremely lucky in getting one. Um, I remember spamming the Best Buy site and, and doing checkout three times in a row to get one. I know my wings are clipping the edge of these planes right now. Um, so yeah, but what I'm saying is that um, if you don't, you know, if if you're looking to upgrade, you might want to consider a processor because it did a lot for my frames. I realize I'm running a pretty high end already, you know, with the video card, but the processor helped a lot. So, you know, if you're trying to hold out for a new video card and it, it's, you know, really impossible to get your hands on one, there are processors in stock. So you might, you know, you might want to look into upgrading the processor. No trick or treating. <laughs> I'm just parking right on top of someone else. We got to we got to sign the same parking spot. It looks like. Um, but anyway, yeah, I just wanted to say that that might be an option for you guys if if you can't get your hands on a video card, like a lot of people can't. All right, so fuel condition shut off, and I believe I just can turn. Uh, what do I just turn off the battery? It's not just the battery. Oh, it is just the battery. There we go. 48 minutes. That was a that was a longer flight than it felt like to me. I think those procedure turns just add a bunch of uh, a bunch of time to the flight. So awesome. So yeah, everybody is on their way to parking. It's funny how it. Uh, if you run into this with a camera, you might have to reset it where it like um, it tilts the camera for some reason. All right, we made it. Uh, I'm good. Uh, finally able to write. Yes, I saw it correct that I was still landing at some point. I had no ATC. The arrival procedure failed. I had to turn around and do a manual. Oh, that was all manual. Nice. Yeah, we saw you come in for the landing. I hope you uh, saw us actually this time. Uh, I'm good. My old eyes can't see past 30 FPS. <laughs> Well, I'm going to try, uh, I am going to try to use track IR a bit more. I was working on a video. Sorry, I haven't had a new tutorial out in a while, but hopefully these streams are, uh, 
are, are providing enough right now to do some of these procedures. I do want to make an ILS and a missed approach video at some point. Um, little personal news tomorrow morning, I'm getting my wisdom teeth taken out. I realize uh, being almost 40, it's pretty late to get my wisdom teeth out, but they have to come out now. Um, so I'm doing that tomorrow morning. So I will be not, um, not probably not streaming this week, probably not streaming on Thursday. I'll probably feel good enough next Sunday. Uh, once I'm all healed, this that'll be swollen for about a week. Um, so I'll probably check in on Discord and say, I'm in bed sleeping and the wisdom teeth got taken out successfully. So that'll be fun. So I'll be doing that and uh, probably be more quiet than usual this week. Thanks, Mackin. Mackin. Oh, yours got removed this year? Yeah, a friend of mine uh, said he got his removed when he was 40. And it seems like um, it seems like there are like disagreements on what between dentists or something like to when to get them taken out. Because I remember like 10 years ago, my dentist, you know, said, oh, if you don't have any problems with your wisdom teeth, don't take them out. And then this dentist now says, you know, I realized that was a long time ago. Um, and they basically said, if they're not causing any problems, don't take them out. And then, you know, when I go to see this oral surgeon, because um, another de another dentist told me to get them taken out finally, um, he's like, oh yeah, nobody over the age of 20 should have their wisdom teeth. I was like, what? <laughs> so anyway, we'll see how it goes. I hope uh, I hope my recovery is fast too. Guess you won't be able to talk after the removal. <laughs> yeah, bad for streaming, exactly. So probably won't be on on Thursday. We'll see. I might feel better by then, but I'll uh, I'll let you guys know. And uh, yeah, thanks for the good luck. Got yours removed. That's awesome. Yeah, I hope yours went well as well. I'm, ho I'm hoping the uh, surgery is smooth. It should be. They said it'll take less than an hour. So yeah, I'll be on the uh, fun the fun drugs for a day. Miss the flight. Yeah, well, thanks for joining anyway, Warren. Yeah, um, hope to do another one next Sunday. And thanks to all you guys for joining. I know a lot of you guys join every flight. Um, so it's awesome to have you guys along every time. Thanks for hanging out. And uh, yeah, thanks. if you want to hang out in the Discord, it's linked in the chat below. If you guys want to do any uh, flights together. Um, and yeah, I will talk to you guys uh, after surgery tomorrow at some point. And to the new people that join, thanks so much for joining. And uh, hopefully do this again next Sunday. Hope you guys have a good rest of your day or night. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time. I'll keep in touch with you on Discord and stuff. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Bye.